It's time for Windows Weekly, episode 159. Paul Therat is back from Portugal. We're going to find out what he thinks about the big layoffs or changes at Microsoft and the story of how he lost his iPhone when he was overseas. Windows Weekly is coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is... Is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thorat, episode 159, recorded June 3rd, 2010. Gypsies stole my iPhone. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Hover.com. Hover is domain name registration and management that's simple. For 10% off your new domain, go to twit.hover.com. And by Astaro Corporation, makers of the Astaro Security Gateway. To try the Astaro Security Gateway free in your business, call 877 the number 4 A S T A R O. And by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com slash windows. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers everything you need to know that coming out of the beautiful uh, suburban village of Redmond, Washington. Apparently, there's a big company up there. The number two tech company in the world, Microsoft. <laughs> I guess it depends on how you measure it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't resist. <laughs> Paul Theron is here. He's back. He's the editor-in-chief of the Supersite for Windows, winsupersite.com, news editor for Windows IT Pro, the author of Windows 7 Secrets, Windows Vista Secrets, the uh, forthcoming Windows Phone Secrets, and... Uh, <laughs> the forthcoming, my other PC is a tablet. <laughs> <laughs> Secrets, <laughs> you know, which would be a great bumper sticker. Hey, if when you know when you write your memoirs, memoirs, you could say Paul Thorat's secrets would be good. Yeah, my memoirs are going to be called Paul Thorat was wrong and twenty-seven other anecdotes that aren't true from the sidelines. Yeah, that aren't true. Paul yeah. is always right. We know that. No, 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 that's not true. Hey, thank you and welcome. Uh, thank you for coming back. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm glad to. Uh, well, welcome you. home. How was Lisbon? Or where it was were great. you? Were you in Lisbon? Lisbon. And yeah, you, it was, it was nice. all, it, it, this was your 20th anniversary. Yep. Yep. And uh, was yep. it all it was cracked up to be? <laughs> well, uh, more of the same, really, you know, but, um, but that's good. Everything, After 20 you know, years, there are no surprises. Sure, sure. Hell, I've been married 19 years and there's no surprises. So I can only imagine what it must be like to be married 20. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pretty much. Hey, but here's the know. good news. And I, I was yes. looking into this. Uh, now, due to uh, the uh, the way divorce laws work, you owe her everything. It's not half anymore. It's all it's, it actually after the twentieth year, it, it the percentages skew in her favor. Oh yeah, she uh, she so owns is, you which now. Is maybe how yeah. it should be. Yeah. yeah. So you you miss you missed the you missed your last. Tell out. me what's what's seventy five percent of zero? <laughs> not not the math guy, but <laughs> no. Yeah, this is mean talk. This is how guys talk. <laughs> when 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 uh, when my wife gets together with her girlfriends. They all talk about their husbands, and mostly yeah. pejoratively. You know, he can't get it up. He's, you know, he's <laughs> Yikes. Oh, wow. boring in bed. Uh, you know, what's wrong you know, with I'm, him? I'm, he's I've always been depressed by what passes as kind of common, accepted conversation, right? And yet I caught myself. I did this at basketball. Some guys were kind of screwing around, and one guy was imitating his wife, and he, he kind of made this sound like, ibb, ibb, you know, kind of thing. And right. I said, are you sure you weren't talking to my wife? Uh -huh. And then every every but guy in the court was like, oh, you can't, but you, ha no. you can't not and then I participate thought to myself. What the hell is wrong with me? I know. I don't, you I don't know, like, like to what, do that. I, you just fall into this, but you can't help it. No, you're terrible. with the guys and you don't yeah. want them to think you're you a wussy. literally are a Neanderthal. Yeah, we are. Basically, no, it's not we, something are. we shave. Yes. Occasionally. <laughs> okay. From time to time. Some yeah. of us, Tom Merritt seems to have stopped, but, <laughs> but that doesn't make us any less of a chimpanzee. No, and no. we are shit apes. That is what we we're are. Shaven apes. Yeah. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, welcome back. It's, we did miss you, but <laughs> I, Mary Jo and uh, Ed did a great job last week. Right, and you know, uh, and thank you to both of those guys for doing that. Um, I I love both those guys, and it, and it's neat for me because um, I didn't always uh, like them at all. Actually, in fact. <laughs> You know, before I got to know them, I didn't like them at all. And uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think that's one of the cool things, you know, uh, that's happened. <laughs> uh, so, 
It's such candor, Paul. Yeah. No, I mean, we've, we've discussed this amongst ourselves, you know. Um, I love those guys. I mean, I'm, I'm glad they did it, too. and I'm glad they can do it, and then I'm happy to have them back whenever. I mean, I, yeah, they're great. Well, Ed, Ed, I've known for years. Dvorak introduced me to him, and we ha used to have yeah. him on the radio show back when he was at PC Computing. Uh, you've introduced me to Mary Jo. We, we think the world of her. In fact, we're talking about doing an Enterprise show with yeah, her. Yeah, and you should. And yeah, you should. Yeah, she's so great. Yeah, um, we were talking about that in New York, and I said, you got to talk to... Yeah, no, we're very interested. We're very yeah. interested. And uh, i got some people saying, well, she's Microsoft. It's not going to be a Microsoft Enterprise show. No, we know we have other hosts there, Oracle or... SAP or whatever, you know, these big enterprise. I know oh, nothing. She's been, she's been around forever. She, she knows, knows everything. everything. She knows everything about everybody. I mean, she, as they the say, knows where the bodies are buried. <laughs> yes. Yes. So anyway, thank you, Mary Jo and Ed, for uh, filling Yeah, in. absolutely. No, that's great. I noticed Mary Jo Foley was upside down. Uh, <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> that, um, you know, Windows 7 was her idea. Yeah, that's okay. There is that's too bad. Yeah, it's too bad. Um, there is it was a driver. <laughs> it's like you were trying to shake the change out of her pocket or something, you know. <laughs> was this, you know, <laughs> we could have fixed it, but it would take another half hour. And I thought, what the hell? It's not like anybody's going to notice. No. <laughs> Pretty much, we spent the you know, entire the entire show in the chat room. Saying, I gotta yes. stop drinking. I swear to God, Mary Jo's upside we down. We know Mary Jo is upside down. It's funny. Even my uh, chief of engineering, Ken Shepherdson, yeah. sends a note saying, "Do you know she's upside down?" It's like, yeah, oh. right. <laughs> it's All right, I was over here playing zombies versus plants. I didn't even look at her. Oh, I pushed the upside down button. Whoops. <laughs> the upside down button. Yeah. See, that shouldn't be a key. That's the problem. That's what I'm saying. Well, anyway, it was, I'm sure it'll be fixed. It, it was weird because we'd had her on many times, so we didn't pay a lot of attention to her setup. We figured, well, she's been on. We, we vetted her. But yep. she had a, a, she had a computer she'd she used before, but she brought it in. Yeah, it was a driver. It's a video driver. Known video driver issue. Sure. The software has got to have a rotate. <laughs> you would, no, it didn't. You would think no. it did. It's a bug. It's a known bug in that particular hardware. I see. I see. Weird. So, Paul, okay. did did you did you like pay attention while you were? I hope not while you were gone to anything. Pay attention? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I I wrote news stories each morning um, really? just to keep up with that. Oh. Are you uh, still married? Yeah, that's about all I did though. Oh, good. It was quick. It was quick. Good. Um, anything? Yeah. Uh, well, I have we a hard time remembering what happened last did week. Did you have actually. anything that you wanted to talk about in uh, the Ed well, and Mary Jo show? No, no, no. I didn't. I didn't listen to the whole thing. I, I watched the beginning and I saw that she was upside down, and I thought that was rather ridiculous and, and unfortunate. <laughs> so, hopefully, we can get that. Paul, fixed we do it. that on purpose so that people yeah, will yeah. miss you. Say, I should have. You know, I should have. If I had thought, I would have made my own video upside down as a uh, show <laughs> of solidarity. Funny. That would have been funny if you'd come on the yeah, upside down. Just come on upside down. Actually, Except you I would are upside, been down. upside down, and my hair would have been hanging. <laughs> yeah, up. Well, that, that, that would be funny if only you were upside down. The rest of the room were normal. <laughs> That's what I need. It's one of those 2001 rooms, you know, like a Richard Gere gravity boot setup. Yeah, That's all. Yeah. Works no, I'm gonna. I, I'll touch on some of the Jay Allard, Robbie Bach stuff. I'm sure you talked about that. that we did, before. and and I th and you know, th uh, here's the craziest story. This uh, story by was it Rob Enderley, one of the analysts? Yeah, who yeah, said yeah. The Robbie <laughs> well, he, Bach. Uh, come on, he, he didn't really mean that seriously. Was a but, fifth columnist for yeah, Apple. Yeah. I love that kind of stuff. Um, I, I I would give anything for that to be true. I would give because frankly, that is the only thing that excuses those two people. <laughs> Right, we'll we'll get to that. Wait, really? If, okay. If they, did, right. if they did it on purpose, at least they have an excuse. For but as far as I'm concerned, those two people set Microsoft back a decade, and they're almost personally responsible for what has happened. That's coming up. Yeah. But first, first, what the hell happened to your iPhone? <laughs> so I want to preface this with two two things. Um, the first is. I have spent the past almost decade reading up on this stuff. And by this stuff, I mean traveling and uh, the things you need to look out for and the right way to do things, you know, how to be savvy when you go to Europe mm. and not stick out like an American. I mean, mm. it's, it's tough for me because I'm six feet tall and I'm big and I'm very clearly an American guy. Yeah. Um, I don't have to wear white sneakers or a logo T-shirt or a baseball hat to, to, for people to know that I'm American. But, you know, you do the right things. You wear a money belt. You know, you don't have anything valuable, valuable in your pockets and all that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing <laughs> I just want to preface this story with is I have some crazy stories. In fact, I have, 
I've caught myself telling people stories and wondered what they think of me because these things sound absolutely impossibly untrue. For example, uh, the time that I chased a bank robber out of a bank. What? And he's spewing money all over the Why place. Why would you do that, Paul? It's because I worked your... at the bank. Oh, you worked there. And you were we crazy. We had been robbed several times in a row. Uh -huh. And the bank was in the process of being sold to another bank. And they weren't going to spend a cent on protecting us. And this guy did not have a gun. He, you could, I saw his finger and I said, screw this. Oh. I'm going after this you, guy. You got and, mad. Uh, yeah. So there's a crazy story, right? And there's more to it. But let's just say... He got caught, by the way, and I actually... Did, did you tackle got, him? No, I didn't, I didn't catch him myself, but I actually did get to go to his uh, court case and point to him, you know, from the, from the witness stand or whatever they call it. But, uh, yes, anyway. that was the man I chased. Yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, um, <laughs> so this, this kind of falls under that category, I guess, a crazy story, um, which, by the way, you know, the, the bank robber story, I remember my son uh, a couple of years ago said to me, Dad, you know, have you ever, have you ever seen a bad guy? Like, if, you know, run into a bad guy. And I said, no, Mark, I've never, no, that, that stuff doesn't happen in real life. And I said, oh, wait, yeah, actually, I did chase a bad guy out of a bank one time. <laughs> you know, it's, it sounds dumb. Like, it sounds impossible. Oh, but I bet your kids love it. Uh, yeah, and his eyes went, you know, saucer shape. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we were in Lisbon, and it was going great. And unfortunately, on the last night, my iPhone was stolen by a Romanian gypsy. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on. Are you sure? Sounds, How do you uh -oh. know? How do I know? Yeah. Um, was he playing a fiddle? And did he and have no, a, it was a It was a woman. It was a small uh -huh. woman. No, it was the oldest trick in the book. And it, it, it's a variation on something that's very common in Europe that I've read about and seen video on, which is, you're, you know, you're out and about in a kind of a touristy area, and this woman will walk up with, like, a baby that's tied to oh, her. Yeah. And it looks like she's holding it with one hand. Oh, yeah. And she's got one hand out, but her, her other hand, which is not really holding the baby, is picking your pocket as she's <sighs> accosting you. See, See you, you know to look out for this stuff. You're looking you at know? the baby, and she's got her hand in your pocket. You didn't hear the, the little click? No, no. So this, that, that's not actually what happened, but it was, a, it was a variation on that, which was my wife and I were in a restaurant. We were actually way in the back of the restaurant against the wall. So I had my phone out on the table against the wall, you know, as far from the front door as you could possibly be. And uh, this woman, little woman came in. She wasn't speaking Portuguese. I didn't understand the language. And, and she, the only word she said that made any sense was baby. But... She put down on the table a bunch of things on top of my food and my phone and oh, everything else. Oh, and picked a it bunch up. Of things. And then when and she costed us and and I have to say the one great thing about Lisbon is that um, there are these people that are out in the street selling things, you know, sunglasses right. or uh, bangles, you know, like uh, necklaces, whatever. And if they walk up to you and you're in a cafe or something and and they you know, we got sunglasses, whatever, you say no, and then they just leave. You know, there's no craziness. This woman was all over us. Like, she wouldn't leave. And we got really upset without realizing what was happening, like idiots, mm. even though, again, I mm. spent a lot of time reading up on this stuff. Mm. And um, Well, that's why it works. She, you get distracted. Yeah. It's uh, like a magician. Yes, right. So she finally got out of there. And, uh, you know, about five minutes later, I said, oh, damn it. You know, my phone's gone. So the, the nice part about this, a bunch of the things that kind of worked out, the, the guy who owned the restaurant uh, apologized and had a computer upstairs. And I was able to go uh, turn the phone off you uh, through it. AT&T. Yeah. Uh, you'd suspend the service. Right. I, I have it on a lock anyway, so they weren't going to be able to get into my stuff. Right. And, um, you know, whatever, you know, I, it, it's suspended, so no problem. Um, I have my old iPhone, so until I get something new, I'll just, you know, I, rolling that over was no problem. You know, the, we filled out a police report just in case, and the cops who came were classic. It was like a comedy routine. It was like the older, kind of heavier guy and the younger, skinnier <laughs> guy. And they both, as always, speak awesome English and then apologized for their English, at least. Yeah. 20 times. I mean, classic. <laughs> classic European uh, experience. But this guy said to I'm me... I'm so sorry. My English is so poor. I, I've had that exact experience. <laughs> yeah. And, he's, and I said, really? Because you speak better English than we do. Thank you, know, you for... Uh, your Portuguese um, is amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. But my so English said, is so weak, and I do apologize. Yeah. No, I, listen. France, Italy, Germany, yeah, I know. and now Portugal. I've had this experience. You know again what? And again. They know. They're doing You know this. who doesn't speak English Shameless. properly, though? Who? The English. Yeah. Those people have no idea what no they're doing. Idea. But anyway, no. um, we... <laughs> This guy says, the one thing he did said that I didn't understand, he said, oh, these people, he said, did she have papers and things? I said, yeah, I said, the Romanian uh, gypsies. And I said, okay, she looked like a gypsy, but um, Ro I, Romanian, I don't you know, black hair. I didn't, I couldn't tell what she was, but she wasn't Portuguese. So uh, he well, said, that's, you, know, you know, that's good. But isn't the gypsy the, you know, the kind of the, the, the scapegoat of Europe now? I mean, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but I knows? have to tell you, if you saw the picture of this woman and I said, use one word to describe this woman, you would say. You're gypsy. a Romanian gypsy. 
she was gypsy. Yeah. So he says, uh, you know, they're like a uh, like a brag. And I said, no, that's not it. He said, no, they're like a like a brag, you know, a brag. And I said, no. Nope. Brag. He says, you know, when um, uh, flies come in and they destroy all the corn. And I said, a plague. Pl plague. Says, yes, that's the word. They're plague. like a plague. Yeah, they are like. <laughs> so, does your dog bite? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, that is not my dog. So, by the like way, the break. single funniest scene ever in any movie. Just so clear. Yes, that I know. Not I knew dog. you would love that. I don't know how I knew, but I knew. Anywho, <laughs> um, do you have it? So it was, it was our last night, so it didn't, it didn't ruin the vacation or anything. But and you know, you didn't want that iPhone anymore anyway. I'm going to upgrade it next week. Exactly. <laughs> it's know? almost as if she knew she was taking it off your hands. She probably was going to Gazelle. There was... Uh, I, just my, well, just to... Yeah, I don't know if this will make you feel better, but uh, Abby left yeah. her... She was on the college visits, left her iPhone at the, her future college bard. So I lent her my iPhone, which she promptly lost or nice. got stolen. Actually, we think it was stolen out of her bag. So I'm in the same boat. And it's, and, you know, it's one of those things. It's been a few weeks, but I'm not going to buy a new one or... No, not now. Because next week, a new one's right. coming out. I think I'll go buy a new iPhone. What the heck? <laughs> do you have now any would be a good, You do. Well, you do have them in stock. No, one, no one's buying them. Huh? That's interesting. This is a Leo Laporte. I would because, you know, I okay, yeah. so for graduation present, I got her the Panasonic Lumix DX. I can't remember what a seven. Hmm? Literally, the next day, the new one comes out. Yeah. Literally. It's like the Laporte curse. You know, it is my curse. So I'm not going to fall for this. I'm not buying a new iPhone. I think I think I may be wrong that June 7th we'll hear about that. You know what I'm liking now, though. Editorial rant either. But I will say that this event has re reaffirmed my belief that the iPhone 3G to 3GS upgrade is like the worst upgrade ever. I mean, I, going back to the 3G, it's just the same phone. It's pretty much the it, same. It doesn't have a compass. <laughs> you know, I, I guess it doesn't do the, you know, the, the more accurate GPS turn by turn thing, I guess. I, I, you know, whatever. No, but it's pretty much the same. It's the same thing. And, you know, I think we're going to be in the same evolutionary boat, frankly, with the next iPhone. With the apes? <laughs> <laughs> we're just shaving apes. You know what I'm really liking, though? And I think this yeah. is both a, a, a strength and a liability of the Android is that they have many handsets and they're, ha and they're iterating really, really fast. You know, I was just thinking about this. So I, I was reading a review of the Evo, I think it's called, love, the Sprint, Sprint one. Do you have this? the Evo. Okay, so here's the thing. This thing is, uh, the screen is considerably bigger than any phone, I guess. It's beautiful looking. It's thin, you know, yada, yada, yada. Yep. Um, do, don't you get the feeling, though, now that, is there a new best Android phone coming out That's every single the problem. week now? That's I mean, it's the almost, problem. Who's going to buy it's almost too fast. Exactly. I looked at this thing and I thought to myself, you know, that looks nice. I, I should consider getting one yep. of these things. And I thought, why would I do this? Exactly. You know, it's. I mean, next week there's going to be another yet again better. I think that's going to hold them back a little bit, don't you? I do too. I'm starting to get freaked by how often the best one gets one upped. Right. You know. Well, this is the best one today. <laughs> maybe maybe for a yeah. month. It comes yeah, out tomorrow. Maybe, by the time you see this podcast, this thing will already be obsolete. I think it's very possible. Right? Very I mean, it, possible. It runs 2.1, if I'm not mistaken, and not 2.2, but it has some stuff in it. Well, it has this like HTC tethering. Sense, which, I, yeah, it's tethering for yeah, eight, okay. and the tethering works great. It has great. Uh, an HD version of YouTube, I think, and... Yeah, it's a really it, it nice looks phone. Interesting. It looks and interesting. And it has a stand. Yeah. See, for, yeah. for right. travel, yeah. it's great, because you could just... Right. Watch it on right. the uh, tray table. And it's, you know, it's, it's uh, Gina Trapani on the Twig yesterday said, it's just almost too big, but not quite. It's like as right. big as you could make a phone and not make it kind of absurd. Well, that's maybe what you're looking for. Exactly. Right? That's exactly where you want to be, isn't it? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually very happy with it. I think it's a very nice phone. You know, I know a, uh, a gypsy in Lisbon would be very happy to see that phone. Just put some papers on the table here and it's yours. Just cover it up, and if it's gone when you come back, I won't even notice. Yeah. Oldest trick in the book. Uh, you know? Well, seriously. I'm glad you told me because I would have fallen for it. I would say, oh, the baby, that's a cute baby. I, I think we had been lulled by this sense of, no, we had wanted nothing to do with this woman's baby. Couldn't have cared less. But it wasn't, uh, it's good because it wasn't uh, a baby. Our it actually was a with these kind of huckster types was so positive that when she walked up and didn't leave immediately, it was surprising. You know, it was... Um, almost shocking. You know, we could, it's, couldn't believe it. I don't know. You know, it's shocking. <laughs> you're glad, <laughs> I'm telling you, you're glad you lost that iPhone. 
Did you, okay. you saw that AT and T is dumping its flat rate? Oh, we're going to talk about this. Jeez. And now, yeah. talk about shocking. I, According to Engadget, yeah. yep. AT and T says you can complain, but if you complain to the CEO, we're going to send you a cease and desist letter. Really? That's customer service. Is that it's just Engadget or uh, anybody who complains? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> let's see here. A reader sent uh, Giorgio Galante sent uh, AT&T CEO two emails in two weeks, resulting yeah. in a phone call from the executive response team. Which I have, and by the way, I recommend this all the time to the radio show listeners because most CEOs have executive response teams that do a good job in handling right. customer complaints. The response from the response team: further emails will result in a cease and desist letter. So. That's interesting. I, I, one of the things I, I wrote in, uh, in the wake of this AT&T price change is that AT&T, for all of the problems they have with the network and, and the service issues and so forth, uh, very real problems, um, has awesome customer service. Awesome customer service. Who? Um, the, yes. And they have an application for the phone that does uh, data and voice metering so you can see where you're at in your plan which will come in very handy now with this tiered stuff. I use it when I go to Europe because one of the things you can do on AT&T, which is fantastic, is you can buy blocks of data for use internationally and you get you know X amount for X number of dollars. Yeah. And then you can see how you're doing as you go and make sure you're staying within those limits because obviously once you start uh, roaming outside of the, the, you know, the prepaid package, it gets very expensive. The other thing they do now, which they didn't do right when the iPhone first came out, is as you start to roam, i.e. go to a different country especially, you get a free text message that says, hey, by the way, you're here now and these charges are going to apply. So here's how you should you know, configure your phone if you don't want to uh, use data and so forth. So they, they do a very good job. And, and the times I've had to go into the store, like I did after my Gypsy episode recently, um, or the times I've had to call them on the phone, they've been fantastic. And uh, I'm actually very surprised that they're doing that. I, I get the feeling that they felt like this customer was... Maybe he was maybe you know. Stalking yeah, you or, don't know really, and that's a good point. Thank you for being uh, a responsible journalist. Journalist, unlike me, I think I've spent too much well, time in talk radio. I, 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 don't I have to know. learn my lesson. I mean, we don't know what those emails said. You're right. Um, one guy got this uh, thing. I mean, I, I suspect hundreds of people write the CEO all the time and don't yeah. get threatened. Yeah, you're so. right. Thank you, Paul. No, I'm just you uh, talked me down. Devil's no, no, advocate. no. That's good. You've talked <laughs> but as far down. as the as far as the data plan thing goes, we should. I mean, just to go over that very quickly, um, this is a good way to save money if you're not using the data a lot. And one of the things you can do, and again, great customer service, they on their support website, you can see what your data usage has been for as long as you've been a customer. So I went back and looked at it, and unfortunately for me, I fall in between these two plans. So uh, right. the two new plans are 200 megabytes for $15 a month. Which is nothing. Two, 200 is nothing. megabytes, you can't. It's not. Oh, but you'll be surprised how low mine is, my usage really? is. Really? And then uh, two gigab uh, gigabytes for uh, $25. Hmm. Now, my, my wish would be that there would be something in the middle. You know, uh, for $20, have there be a one gigabyte range. If there was, that's what I would do. I guess if because you're going to tier, tier. Be truly tiered, yeah. yeah. I think they're trying to make it simple, which is understandable. Um, but the problem is my data usage, I think I average somewhere in the 320s, 320 gigabytes, uh, megabytes, sorry, uh, per month. It's not much above 200, but it's enough that I could never do 200 because if you, if you choose the 200 plan and you go above 200, you get charged another 15 per 200 per month, meaning the cost would actually be exactly what it is now, uh, $30 a month. Uh, for the data. So I wouldn't save any money. So I guess I could go with the one gigabyte, I'm sorry, the two gigabyte plan and save $5 a month. But I mean, how nice would it be if there was a middle tier, which I could do, then I would save $10 a month. And now we're talking about a pretty significant amount of money, you know. Uh, but anyway, they have so an app for the So you think this is a good thing? Uh, well, I think I it's an the loss of flat rate, but I guess it was never going to last. Well, I've always, so the problem is I've always thought that if they had a tiered plan, I could save money. Because I know that I don't use this thing all that much. And this has been borne out by actually seeing the usage. You can look at it. Now, if, there were, if you think about uh, $15 a month is two, you know, 200, 200 megabytes. If half again that is what I'm averaging, which I am, and, and that thing costs you know, $20 a month, I would save money. That would be great. Um, but because the next plan up is pretty high, right. I'm only going to save a little bit of money. So it's not as good as it could be, but... I think they're setting the stage for all of the other 
companies to do the same thing. And one of the things I wrote this morning when I wrote about this was that in the absence of any Verizon advertising, where they where they come out with an ad in the next right. 24 hours that says, hey, by the way, if you're looking for all you can eat data, we have it. Because uh, you know Verizon's pretty aggressive in going after at and um, I suspect they're not going to do that, and the reason they're not going to is because I think they're going to go to and do the same thing. This will so. be a test of whether the cell market it really is competitive or if they're all just basically doing the same thing. And you're right. The pricing is so close. The standards are so close. I just... Maybe Sprint or T-Mobile, kind of these this the second tier, you know, uh, uh, we try harder guys. We'll, be, we'll keep the unlimited. Maybe they'll keep a... the unlimited. And, and I just hope that somebody does. But if they all go to tiering, which they may, because I understand their costs. It's not like HomeWired, where their costs to provide you with all that bandwidth are kind of fixed. There really is or a at limitation. Least the upgrades are easy, right? Yeah. I mean, upgrading wireless infrastructure is very expensive right. and complicated. right. And if I'm not mistaken, based on my experience with AT and T, uh, results in some pretty negative downtime while right. they're working on it too. I mean, it's it I, seems I like I kind of understand that. If anybody's yeah. going to tier, it probably should be the cell carriers. As much as I hate to admit it, it what, what, yeah, what, and, and it, it, for, for whatever it's worth, and I I've said this before too, but uh, AT and T is lousy from a network perspective. They started off from a very bad position and have improved very dramatically, but are still you know catching up in some ways. Um, I have to think that if the iPhone was on Verizon or Sprint or whatever, that those networks would be horrible, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, there's so much more data usage occurring on AT&T because of the iPhone that it's, it's a little unfair in some ways. Some people think, and I think, that we may see that soon, like Monday, mm -hmm. because Monday's the day that AT&T discontinues that $30 unlimited plan and on the raises iPad, the, on the iPhone. for canceling your plan yeah monday which many have led to have led many to believe that that will be the day that verizon gets the iphone That's or something I, I, kind of what i'm thinking yeah it's possible um uh, it it's an interesting coincidence if it doesn't happen but uh yeah i don't know it's, it's almost as if you know steve wrote a note and said hey guys we're gonna announce verizon on monday and i you know when the ipad came out and had that uh, the data plans that weren't tied to a uh, commitment of any kind. I figured the iPhone was safe on at or at and was safe, I guess. Exactly. Uh, for a couple of years, you know. Yeah, that was that, the tit that for tat. Was, the that, that was the deal quo. with the devil you yeah, know, that they made. Exactly. Uh, that they would get rid of that. Well, they're not getting rid of the data plan. That's not fair. They're, they're just getting rid of the unlimited option. So, uh, and the only reason I, I care is I stream a hell of a lot of data, and uh, I love yeah. it that people can watch on the iPhone or the Twit app. Well, you government. should go and look and see what you're doing because if you you might be surprised, and it's very easy to check. Ken, what is what is the uh, if you watch on the uh, iPhone or the iPad, what how much bandwidth do you use a month? If you watched us say eight hours a day, <laughs> I think it's <laughs> like, as the typical viewer would. Well, I would like yeah, them to. It, by the way, it's absolutely impossible that anyone has the battery life to withstand eight hours okay, of okay. wireless streaming it. Um, I'll do a calculation. It's uh, Let's say a uh, reasonable two hours a day. No, but you should look at what you're actually doing. I mean, if you, you have an iPhone, you can go to you know, wireless.att.com. Yeah. It's very, it's very I don't easy. have an iPhone. A gypsy has mine, but... Uh, okay, that was, that was low. No, <laughs> I told you mine got stolen too. Oh, yours got stolen too, yeah. I'm in the same boat as you, my friend. Uh, I, could, uh, I, could, I think it's going to be... Uh, I think even... I think it just hurts my business. You know, our our typical uh, podcast, well, but uh, yours is about 100 megabytes it. audio only. So it, it wouldn't take very long to, you know, okay. you listen to yeah, a few yeah. podcasts to, to hit that limit. I'd have to look and see what kind of uh, battery life implications that has. I mean, ideally, people are doing this over Wi-Fi. Uh, that's true. You're right. No, that's true. Yeah, I don't know. Hey, let's take a break. There's a big, the, the, we've been talking about it, but it's actually here now, Windows Life Essentials 4. And some really neat new stuff. And I know people are wanting us to talk a little bit about Windows. <laughs> so enough about Portugal gypsies and the iPhone. We'll be back. Well, AT&T affects no, everybody. No, this, yeah. this affects everybody because I can tell you, whatever phone you're on, you're not, your tiered pricing is going to happen now. They, you know, and, and watch carefully because I wouldn't be surprised if ISPs say, okay. Because they've been wanting to do this for a while, too. Everybody would yeah. like to make more money. Sure. Who wouldn't? I know I would. <laughs> I, I can't think of anyone. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a constant stress and strain between the consumer who wants to spend less and the business that wants to charge you more. I understand. I am a business businessman. I understand those things. In fact, let's take a break for a commercial so I can make some money. 
I just uh, sent off the check to college. I need this. <laughs> I need it bad. I want to invite you to use Hover.com. We just moved all our domains to Hover. It's by the folks at Two Cows, who I've known for years and have huge respect for. And now uh, they have Hover.com, which is their official domain registrar. It's ICANN certified, of course. And they, you know, if you've ever tried a, registering a domain name with some of these other guys where it's 50 clicks before you have bought the domain as they try to upsell you every service under the sun, you will love how simple, how straightforward Hover is. If you go to twit.hover.com, you'll send, save 10%. Uh, you're not going to get all those extra upsell services. They make it easy to register, manage domains, and email. You may remember them as Domains Direct from Two Cows. They've been doing it since 1997. It's just a, a new name, and they wanted you to know about it. And I have always loved uh, this registrar. Hover.com. Go to twit.hover.com. They have a new no-hold policy for customer service calls during business hours, Monday through Friday, 9 to 8 Eastern. You will get an, a rep in, in, that instantly. No hold, which is, I think, remarkable. Twit.hover.com to save 10% off on your next domain name registration. We are moving all our domains over. I think we can set up uh, all our domains. It takes a little while to get them all moved over. But uh, th this is how much confidence I have in these guys. I've known them for years. They, You may know they do the butterscotch thing that our friends Andy Walker and uh, Sean and um, Amber do up in uh, Toronto. They're just a great company. Hover.com and twit.hover.com to get 10% off. We thank them for their support of uh, Windows Weekly. Oh, you did it! <laughs> Watch carefully. <laughs> He's drinking upside down, my friends. How did you? Do? So you have a button? I have a button. Dang. Ta-da. Maybe I wonder if Mary Jo had a button and just didn't know it. She said she didn't. Actually, there's a button in Skype. There's an upside down button in Skype. Oh, that's gonna that's gonna irk me. Yeah. That's gonna really irk me. <laughs> Ugh. Hover does not have two O's. That's Hoover. Yeah, don't go there. That sucks. They suck, yeah. <laughs> H-O-V-E-R. Two obvious choice. I wonder, you know, last time I did the ad for them, I'm just going to check, make sure they're still alive. Last time we had sent so many people over, which is great. Yeah. That uh, I think they didn't expect. Yes, they've, they've obviously turned on the bandwidth today. It's working just fine. Dot com, dot net, dot org, dot biz, dot info, dot ca, dot us, dot, you know, more people ought to use dot us, I think, at least if you're in the us, dot cc, dot tv, we have a lot of dot tv addresses, dot tell, dot me, dot co, dot uk, dot org, dot uk, great site, come on, twit army, <laughs> see they say welcome twit army, they knew, <laughs> we're ready for you this time. Twit.hover.com. They also do domain forwarding uh, with up to six email boxes. One of the things I tell people is, yeah, it's fine to have a Gmail address or a Hotmail address, but you really ought to have yourname.com or yourname.me uh, because then you own it and it's yours forever. And even if you change services, my mom is going, uh, I'm, uh, you know, she's she, she's on uh, her local ISP Cox. She's probably you probably are you a Cox customer, Paul, or Verizon? No, Verizon. I wasn't in Phoenix. We had yeah. Cox. We have uh, Verizon. Here. Yeah, yeah, she's on Cox, and I said, Mom, what we should just do is set you up with a Gmail account, because uh, and and then we set you up with a domain name that everybody uses, and then you can move mm -hmm. around. It's just the better way to do email. Hava, H O V E R. You know what? I have a lower third here. Uh, I should have used it. Hover.com. Save 10%. So, Paul, let us talk about Windows Live mm -hmm. Essentials, shall we? Yeah. I mean, this is a pretty big deal. I mean, in the same sense that, you know, a new version of Office is a big deal. Uh, Windows Live Essentials is part of the, the new version of Windows Live Essentials is part of this new you know, Wave 4 set of releases that mm -hmm. Microsoft is doing for Windows Live. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be new versions of the online services like Hotmail. And then Essentials, by and large, are the end-user applications uh, for Windows. So in this version, it's uh, Vista and Windows 7 only. And uh, they've always kind of advertised this as, um, you know, the applications that complete or light up the Windows experience. And I think there's some uh, fairness to that in the sense that uh, some of these applications obviously used to be part of Windows, but they pulled them out of Windows so that they can be upgraded 
more frequently. Uh, frequently. And um, if anything, I wish they were <laughs> created more frequently than they are. Um, Windows Live Essentials is on an 18th month, 18 month release schedule, which to me is just um, you know too too slow. But anyway, uh, this re this year we're finally getting a new version uh, of this stuff. So uh, my review is up now. It's a, a eight part review. It's very big. The actual software won't be available in beta form uh, to the public until the end of June. And then I think the final release is right at the end of the summer. So you'll be able to check it out, um, you know, three weeks, I think. Uh, it's uh, after it's huge. Goes so yeah, everything has been updated, right? Yeah. Pretty much. Uh, there's new stuff. There's updated stuff. There's some old stuff that's been gone. You know, one, one of the big uh, things that they fixed in this release is uh, they've consolidated their synchronization strategy. Um, around Windows Live Sync, and there's some good news and some bad news there. You know, uh, previously they had Live Mesh, which I used and recommended, and they had something called Live Sync, which was part of Windows Live. Um, the new product is called Windows Live Sync, but it's actually based on Live Mesh, which is a little confusing. Okay, um, so Mesh didn't go away; they just got rebranded. Essentially, I like mesh. although unfortunately, if you're using Mesh, when you install this uh, product, you it actually uninstalls Mesh. <sighs> Install sync, and then you have to resync your your folders. And the other bad part is that with Live Mesh, you had five gigabytes of uh, web-based storage that was kind of unattached to anything. It wasn't part of SkyDrive; it was just its own thing over on the side. And in this version, it actually synchronizes with SkyDrive, which is great because there's 25 gigs of storage up on SkyDrive, but they only let you sync two gigs of stuff through Live Sync to SkyDrive, which is arbitrary and we, weird. I mean, I, I don't have an explanation for that, and that's too bad. But as far as uh, the capabilities go, you know, the PC to PC kind of peer to peer uh, synchronization is roughly identical to the way it worked before. There's remote uh, PC access, like remote desktop, that works like it did in Live Mesh. Um, they have some very basic um, uh, application synchronization functionality around Internet Explorer favorites and Office. Uh, um, Settings, it works in 2010. I, I'm, I haven't tested it with 2007, but I suspect it works there as well. So there's some good stuff there. And then, of course, uh, you know, the applications themselves. I mean, I, I've recommended this stuff for a long time, but um, applications like Windows Live Messenger, Mail, Photo Gallery, uh, Movie Maker, and, and Writer are all, I mean, every one of them, uh, literally uh, best of class uh, for those kinds of applications. They're fantastic. And and all of them have gotten some neat little updates in this version. I, none of them are major, I think, aside from Messenger, which has been significantly updated. And has become sort of like, the like as Outlook is to Office, I think Messenger is becoming to Windows Live Essentials in the sense that it's the thing you're going to leave running all day long. If you do a lot of stuff around social networking or Twitter and all that stuff, it's a place to consolidate it all into one view. And if you like the Windows, uh, Windows Phone UI stuff, the messenger UI for presenting all of this information is very Windows Phone-esque. It's very attractive. So um, that's, a, that's a major upgrade right there. So there's some good stuff in here um, across the board. You know, Photo Gallery picks up Photoshop-style retouching tools. You know, the ability to, you know, maybe you take three pictures of a, of a family photo, and in each one of them, like, one person's face is off, and you can com you can fuse them into a single photo where all the faces are correct, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, it works pretty good. It's not, you know, again, it's not Photoshop, but it's free. I mean, it works pretty well. So uh, that stuff's all in there. And there's, there's uh, a bunch of good stuff. So I think this is something for anyone who uses Windows, um, assuming it's Vista or 7, um, is going to want to get this as, as soon as they can. It looks really, really good. Yeah, and I, I mean, you know, of course they're going to make changes because um, it was beta. And I, you know, I, I should remind myself that I shouldn't, I can't be pissed that they changed these things because they said it was beta. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't encourage me to try Mesh. That's true, but you know it's it's tough. It was in beta for what two and a half, three years. I mean, um, there were a bunch of I things they promised for Mesh, yeah, yeah, right? And I did too. I yeah. used Windows. Uh, I used Live Sync on at least three books. Mm -hmm. It worked flawlessly for that uh, synchronizing, not just between my own computers and to the web desktop, but also in the in the case of the last book, um, shared with Rafael uh, Rivera, my co-author, and that worked uh, flawlessly. It was really really nice. It still basically does the same thing. It's just that they've gotten rid of this two gigabytes of cloud storage. Now, I'm complaining about this, but to be fair, I don't think I ever once accessed that cloud desktop to get anything uh, out of it. From and that is PC. a lot. Yeah. Uh, what is a lot? Two, two gigs. I mean, I know it's two, less than it was, it's okay. but it's... Yeah. Dropbox I, I gives just, you two I, gigs I, free, and I use, I, sure. I use it all the time, and I don't, I don't 
max it out. So it, it might have been that in the in the years since they released Live Mesh as a beta, that maybe is how the market has consolidated around. You know, two gigs is the free amount. You know, the problem is they don't offer a way to go up from there. You know, right. I would be happy to. Get, I would at least yeah, consider I'd buy more. Yeah, I, I buy storage from Google and I, I back up my photos uh, to Google. Right. So I would consider doing that on Microsoft's thing uh, right for obvious reasons because i i do use photo gallery and it works really right, well right. it'd be nice if i could use that to back up my photos but they don't offer a way to go above 25 gigs of storage so it's just a non what it's, happens it's, if you don't install wave four do you continue can you continue to use mesh and for how long yeah i i don't know what the end of life is on that but for for the foreseeable future yeah you can just keep using mesh so if you really are tied to it for some reason <laughs> Yeah, just don't install. Just don't install. Wave don't 4, upgrade. Yeah. And, and you, you can't upgrade any part of this without getting rid of mesh. It's very specific. Oh it, boy, it warned you up front. You know we're going to get rid of it. Oh you boy, know, sure. and uh, and uh, okay, and they don't push it. You this would be something you'd have to go out and get, or are they going to start saying? Oh no, 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 this, this won't Windows be. Update? This will never be pushed. Okay, you, you'll have to go out and get this. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'll, yeah, if but you, on, if but you didn't note, use it, this is a great time to try it. Yeah. If, you, if you're not tied to mesh. Yep. yep. E even if you are, I, I suspect for most people that that five gig to two gig thing is not actually a huge issue. Um, and your data is not saved. You have to resync. You do, but you know, it's not that hard. So uh, in my case, I had specific folders that were synced between all my PCs anyway. Right. So the, one of the first things I did was say, okay, let's set up new folders. I pointed it to one of those folders and said, okay, now sync this to the other PCs. And it examined the folders on each PC and said they're, they're already the same. So right. it was very quick. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. So uh, Ray Ozzie, well, this all starts at uh, D8, which is uh, the big uh, yeah, yeah. conference that Kara Swisher and Walt Mossberg of the Journal put together. It's a really, it's they're they're very good. I mean, they just get the biggest names, including Jobs once again. Jobs was there uh, yesterday, and among other things, said we're entering a post PC era. Right. Sure we are. Ray Ozzie posts today saying, yeah. No, <laughs> well, I, I would. Well, I would just. I didn't read what Ray Ozzie wrote, but I would. I would point to the facts, <laughs> which are that the PC market this year is going to grow such that we're, we're already selling one million PCs every single day. Yeah, it I mean, Apple makes a big deal. It's got two million iPads sold in yeah. two months. Sure. Which, That's well, one. By the way, I, I want to be very clear about this because people have misconstrued what I've written about this. Um, that's successful, right? Two million of anything is great. It's, it's but, more than the iPhone sold in its first two months by far. Absolutely. Right. Uh, although that was a new product. I, I would, I, well, I would qualify that by saying that the iPad benefits from the years that have expired right. since then, where the Apple ecosystem stuff is all the more right. valuable to people and a known quantity, Absolutely. right? Uh, I would just, you know, it's a different age. I mean, the, I, the iPod, when it first came out, didn't sell at all. Today, right. it's a phenomenon. I mean, you know, you don't know how things are going to go. but Yeah, just because you're I successful just, out of the boxes doesn't mean a success in the long run either. Right, or vice versa, I guess, right. you know. So um, the, I, the iPad selling 2 million um, units in two months is, is, a, is great. I mean, there's no, uh, there's no qualification. That's great. But when you compare it to uh, other popular consumer electronics devices of the day, it, it kind of pales in comparison Android to Android phones are selling 100,000 a day now. Yeah, right. So, um, Nokia phones, God only knows how many million a day. Yeah, and by the way, every one of those devices is tied to a two-year contract where the person is actually spending a couple thousand dollars over two years. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's, it's in, in many ways a more expensive proposition. Um, and I'm not saying it's more impressive. I mean, it, they do more and they're, you know, they're more valuable on the go and so forth. But Different things. I, I, what I wrote about the iPad this week was just that I, as, a, as a PC guy and as someone who looks at technology, I mean, it's hard, not to have this, it's hard not to have this conversation because you want to compare it to something. You know, you want to be able to say, look, it's outselling this or it's not outselling this, so it's good, bad, or indifferent, or it's doing well or it's not doing well, that kind of thing. And you want to be able to kind of pigeonhole it into something. And one of the things that I w thought about a couple of months ago before this thing was available was, you know, what is this thing? Like, what, where, do you, where do you put the iPad? Does it compete with netbooks? Does it compete with real PCs? Does it compete with smartphones or iPod touches? You know, how do you, how do you categorize it? You know, and at the time, uh, I felt like it wasn't a new category. And I felt like we should be able to compare it to something. You know, looking at it now, it's very clear to me that it is, in fact, a new category. And that it's not really fair to compare it to anything else. So if, 
if you were to compare like sales of the iPad to uh, the netbook, it that would be unfair. The netbook would kill it. You know, if you were to compare it to sales of the PC, that would be really unfair because the, the PC would blow it out of the water. They sell two million PCs every two days. I mean, it's not even close. It gets even worse if you you know compare it to uh, smartphones. You know, there's all kinds of things you could compare it to. But my argument is just you know look now with the benefit of two months of experience and so forth, I'm thinking this is a new, it's a new device. It's a new kind of thing. And, and there are competitors like Google and uh, Microsoft and Microsoft's hardware partners who are very busy trying to create devices that will compete in this new market, right? Um, that also to me suggests this is a new thing, you know, that the, the things that Microsoft and its partners are going to make aren't always going to be PCs. Sometimes they're going to be like PC-like devices that run an embedded version of Windows, not Windows 7. That's not a PC, right? All these things point to the same thing, that to understand the iPad, to categorize it, we have to categorize, I think, personally, I think we have to categorize it as a new kind of device. Now, people read this now and they say, yeah, you jerk, you know, two months ago you said this and you said this and you said it wasn't a game changer. And it's like, hey, guys, guys, this doesn't obviate what I said before. I'm just, I'm just kind of coming to terms with what it is. You know, I mean, we're going to see Android tablets like the Dell Streak. We're going to see Windows embedded tablets. It's a new category. That's all. No big deal. I just, just trying to, just trying to categorize it because ultimately, what's going to happen is years going to expire, and and Apple will sell five or eight or ten or twelve million of them or whatever it is, you know, by the end of the year. And now everyone's going to want to say it was a huge success. It was a success. It was a whatever. And then people who are critics of it are going to want to say, yeah, but when you compare it to the netbook, it got killed. When you compare it to this, it got killed. You can, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm trying to establish how I'm thinking of it and that I'm not setting it up for some future, you know, ambush. I'm trying to say, look, it's a new thing. I mean, and as by the way, as far as new things go, selling millions of units, it's crazy. That's really good. So, I mean, I'm trying to be very positive about it, if anything, but a lot of people have really misconstrued that. I'm, I'm a little confused by that because I'm trying to be, if anything, I'm trying to give uh, them the benefit of the doubt. And, and um, you know, it makes sense that Microsoft is going to say, well, maybe it doesn't make sense because Microsoft really has been pushing the tablet form factor for a long time. But this is an interview in the uh, Los Angeles Times with uh, I think it's, uh, David Sarno. Yep. And, and, and David says, uh, with smartphones, tablets, and now televisions, the desktop PC seems if it's, as if it's going to be a small part of the way people use computers. Is the era of the PC over? Yeah. Uh, not, which I've... I've posited that this may be a post we may be entering or beginning the end of uh, the pc era entering a post pc era ray ozzy yep. says i agree i agreed until you said small part the pc is a part <laughs> but it's a growing part pcs are becoming well, this is exactly what you say that's the point i mean yep. by the way um i depending on who you ask the pc industry is going growing somewhere from i think 15 to 20 percent this year but let's say the pc industry grows 10 percent this year um they sold 300 million computers last year right 10% of that is 30 million. An additional 30 million. An additional 30 million. That, that means that just the gr growth rate of the PC market will outstrip all iPad sales combined by three to one or more. Right. That's what that means. Right. So just the growth rate. Now, it but, doesn't but, guarantee. But if, if you only look at numbers, you might miss a larger story, which is developing, which is yep. that we might be looking. He says, and oh, I no, think no, he's no, true, actually, it's before, just more screens in our lives. Let me just, let me, I'm sorry. Let me just, I just want to make sure I get this other half of that in. The other half, the <laughs> the other side of the coin is we, we are already arguably in the post-PC era from one standpoint. And that is that if you look at the way that people uh, consume what we consider a traditional PC uh, resources, you know, uh, browsing the web, uh, running applications, etc. More people are already doing that on cell phones than are doing it on PCs. And the market for these devices is considerably bigger than the market for PCs. So from that standpoint... Um, uh, you know, <laughs> we're sort of, I mean, depending on where you live in, in Africa or in uh, parts of South America or in parts of Asia, there, there was never a PC era, you know, there, they've already jumped ahead to this, um, smart mobile device era. Now, if you want, you could lump the iPad into that category, although I actually don't think that's fair. Um, the iPad is sort of a hybrid device, isn't it? You know, one that kind of sits between those two. There, there are times when you're going to want a bigger screen. Uh, than these tiny little cell phones, uh, other than the one you have. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. most people have tiny, tiny screens. So I, th I think the devil's advocate view would be, in some ways, we're already in the, in the post-PC era, but there will always be, always be, a market for these multifunction, what I call kind of Swiss army knife pr uh, products 
that do lots and lots of things. The, the iPad, you can go back and watch this. Within the first five minutes, Steve Jobs says, it does these like seven things well. He's not trying to make it a PC. We're going after very specific scenarios. It's, I'm not trying to say it's a niche device. That's not really fair, but it is a, it is a very targeted device. It's not a general purpose computer. You know, uh, someday in the future, our walls will all be displays and we'll have access to the internet on every surface that we own and yada, yada, yada. But um, I, I think the iPad is a call for simplicity. It's a call for um, that kind of less is more thing that we've talked about a lot. I mean, I, as a, just as a, someone who likes technology, I mean, I look at this kind of thing and I think, yeah, you know, for a lot of people, this is going to be enough. And that's interesting. It makes... I'm looking at my mom of, right now. She's sitting in, and yeah, using an iPad yeah, yeah, yeah. and is very happy. She has a, a laptop, but, but she But it depends on what it is. I mean, one of the, you know, it's just a little, I was being sarcastic, but honest when I said this, you know, I've got a friend who's a graphic artist and a Mac person and she's, you know, she said, what's going on with this iPad thing? And I... Right, because she kinda, needs it, the, PC, the, the, the Mac. She needs a full... full absolutely. And that's what I said. She said, well, can I... Is there any way that I could use this in my own work. Mm -mm. And I said, yeah. I said, if you are uh, paint with your fingers, uh, <laughs> the iPad would be fantastic. Good but for I finger said, painting. But, but she doesn't, right? She right. uses a, a stylus and uh, um, a digitizer of some kind. She's an actual artist. Um, it's not going to work for her. You know, it's, but it's not that kind of device. It's okay. Um, I, I, it's interesting. I, the way these things are going to evolve over time is interesting to me. Um, the fact that Microsoft... Two guys from Microsoft responsible for the competitor to this thing left this week, well, last week. Interesting to me. The fact that Microsoft has no cohesive plan to compete with this thing at all, interesting to me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think these are serious Is that issues. foolish or is that uh, long-term thinking? Is that, I mean, are they right? Should they not no. worry? No, they should worry. Uh, they should worry. You should always be worried when one of your top two competitors sells millions of anything, you know, yeah. even if you're not in that market. You know, there's a reason that every time Google announces a new service, Microsoft announces a Me Too service or vice versa, by the way, right? The, did you see the Google's going to have a photo on their homepage now? Uh, have you seen this little little tidbit? You know, they're going to copy what? the Bing. Google's oh, copying the Bing. Yeah, that's yeah. a mistake. What, I, the whole point of the Google page was it was fast and light. Yeah, they're going to make it an option um, anyway. Good. But when you look at it, you see it. It's Bing. <laughs> right? It's Bing. Doing... Isn't that interesting? So, these two, but that's how competitors react. And that's a right? good thing for us. It means there's cross-pollinization. There's... Well, that's the reason Android exists. I mean, exactly. Android, a response to the iPhone, a exactly. great response. Yeah. Yep. So I, I don't feel like Microsoft has a good response to the iPad. And I don't feel that what they're doing is a good response. You know, uh, they have a kind of a tiered strategy. Um, they're going to use Windows Phone 7 on smartphones, which is great. I've argued again and again that Windows Phone 7, the OS, would make a lot of sense on a big screen device like an iPad because it offers this panoramic UI. And instead of seeing just a wedge of the screen, you could see the whole screen at one time. And how beautiful would that be? It would be beautiful. What about um, Jobs' contention at D8? He, <laughs> what he said is that in the early days of cars, every car was essentially a truck. It was you know, a way to um, transport d stuff. And he says, PCs are the trucks of the digital age that, yeah, you're still, you're always going to need trucks to do heavy lifting, but you're going to see fewer trucks on the road because yeah. this makes well, sense of diversity of devices, I guess. Is what I haven't looked recently, but up until a couple of years ago, the number one selling vehicle in the United States was a Ford F-150 pickup yeah, truck. So that's a good point. You no, know, whatever, but it's I mean, not all we of can, it. We can stretch these comparisons as far as you want. I, I don't, uh, how do I say this? Uh, yes. I think looked at, Broadly, you could say from a, a computing standpoint, computing is going to become more pervasive and less the purview of sort of this special device, you know, that computing will just be part of things. You know, the Internet is part of TVs now. You can get TVs right. with Yahoo widgets and access to Netflix and that kind of stuff. I mean, you don't need a special box. We're a little but, biased because we are, are PC yeah. users. We love PCs. Well, and, and we use PCs. You know, from, yeah. from my perspective and from your perspective, <clears throat> we need PCs to get our job done. You bet. You know, you bet. Um, uh, I think that most people are not. Um, I've, I, I used I used the phrase, you know, um, contribution versus uh, consumption. You know, um, for good or bad. I mean, the, the iPad many times has been described as a consumption device. People have misconstrued this as meaning it's only a consumption device. And because I use it to write an email, you're wrong. And that's not what I mean. That's a generalization. Obviously, 
uh, I could sit here in front of my PC, which is a contribution device, and do nothing but watch YouTube videos all day long. It doesn't mean it's not a contribution device. It just means, in, that, in this case, I'm not using it for its primary purpose. Right. I think there will always be a market for, you know, PCs as they are now. Because there are people who need to create content. There are people that need to write, edit video, uh, do what you do for a living, whatever it is. You know, there, we, whatever you and I. Is. Yes. Well, no, whatever it is. I mean, it, it, no, but literally because no, it's a Swiss joking. Army knife. It could be anything. Yes. I mean, it it's a general be, purpose. I don't mean whatever it is you do. I mean, <laughs> whatever, no, I know. I was, whatever it is that one <laughs> might want to do. Um, the iPad over time, of course, will evolve. And, and I, you know, I guess the only question now is uh, think about how the netbook was when it first came out. The netbook, w when it first arrived, was not what it is now. It was a PC-like device using solid-state storage, a very small amount, running Linux primarily for the purpose of running a web browser so that you could get online and access, you know, Gmail and, and Google Calendar and so forth. Microsoft looked at this market, saw they were selling millions of units, and said, no, 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 no. So now uh, I think it's 93% of all netbooks, something like that, run Windows. Netbooks have become, have evolved over just three years from that thing to be, to be basically inexpensive computers. That's all they are. They're just cheap computers with small screens and small keyboards. And because that happened, the lines have blurred. Now there are these machines that are kind of in between and they have different names, you know. And what used to be the netbook has become the smart book, right? The smart book is basically the old netbook model, but instead of Linux, they're running typically a Linux-based, but a smartphone OS instead of a, uh, you know, a PC OS. So here we go again. <laughs> you know, we're doing the same thing again. I think the iPad is going to evolve as well. There will be pushes both from Apple and from third parties to make it more of a, what I call a contribution device or a device you can create, you know, a creation device. Um, but I think by and large, un it, if it doesn't stay where it is now, then Apple could, could lose this market because ultimately, these, if it becomes a PC... Well, that even Steve Steve Jobs said it this week. We they, Apple lost that war already. Um, if if Microsoft and his partners or Google and his partners, whoever, are able to wrest this market from Google, it risks becoming a commodity, and it just becomes the net you know the next netbook market or whatever, you know. So I guess we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I mean, I don't I don't have an opinion on that or how it's going to play out. But um, it's very clear to me that Google or sorry that Apple for now has created this new kind of device. And, you know, they kind of cherry-picked from different parts of what they do, and they here it is, and now we'll see the response. You know, we'll see what happens. But as uh, I did catch the beginning of last week's Window Weekly, uh, I think it was Ed who said, you know, um, who can say what's going to happen in 18 months? 18 months ago, Android was nothing. Right. Uh, today, they are already outselling uh, the iPhone in the United States. I mean, it's crazy how fast that happened. That's one thing that we know for sure, that things change faster than they ever have before and that no one has a solid enough lead to say we're safe in technology. I mean, it just it's boom, boom, boom. Right, 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 right. The other thing I'd just point out, you know, I, I'm, I'm disappointed as a, as a Microsoft guy, um, you know, that for the past decade, by and large, this is a company that has been defeated again and again and again in things outside of their core PC market. You know, once you get outside of Windows and Office and Windows Server, you see a company that doesn't perform very well. And it's a company that doesn't perform very well because the business model they have doesn't work in these other markets. Yeah. Um, and whether we're talking about the digital media stuff and the MP3 players and then ultimately the Zune, which is just a copy of the iPod, an excellent copy. I mean, the software in the, in the Zune HD is beautiful. I love it. But ultimately what we're talking about is something that has zero market share. Or the Xbox 360, which started this generation of consoles with a year-long head start and is now racing to try to finish in second place if they're lucky, and they may not even get there. And they've already had the worst single consumer electronics recall in history, $1.2 billion, because these things are so unreliable. And this comes after an estimated $5 billion of R&D to create this product in the first place, which they'll never earn back ever, mm. Right. Um, they made Windows Mobile, which, uh, to be fair, and I, I, I do want to point this out if I haven't already, Windows Mobile was designed a decade ago to fight Palm. <laughs> and, well, it was. And yeah. by the way, they, they won. They did beat Palm. Bye-bye, Palm. But 
the iPhone showed up, smarter, nimbler, quicker, uh, competitor, and their response has been to do nothing. So for the past three years, all they've done is seed market share. That's all they've done. They've just given it away. Well, to be uh, fair, so is everyone else. Okay, but I'm not talking about everyone else. I'm right. just talking about so. right. these products and other products like Media Center, which is excellent, but again, has never gone anywhere, all basically come from the same place, right? right? This entertainment and devices division. Oh, let's get into the Robbie Bach, Jay Allard discussion. So you, my opinion, <laughs> I never... Hold okay. that thought. <laughs> Let me tell you something about those guys, Leo. I want to hear your opinion because it is an interesting one indeed. But before we do that, I do want to mention our friends at Astaro who do the great ultimate Astaro Security Gateway. It is a unified threat management system that is a must-have if you are in an enterprise. You're trying to secure this by yourself or you're using big iron to do uh, what could be done with a lightweight, nimble very high quality device like the uh, Astaro Security Gateway combines the best of breed in both open source and closed source to give you protection from spam, viruses, hackers, complete VPN capabilities. Traditional VPN over uh, uh, IPsec or LTTP over IPsec, uh, PPTP tunneling, but also uh, SSL through SSL, which means it's very easy to install, very easy for the boss to use. You've got intrusion protection, complete content filtering, control over IAM, peer-to-peer, -peer, everything. Naturally, an industrial strength firewall with all the latest state-of-the-art features. And the Astaro update makes sure it stays up to date, that all the virus definitions are always up to date automatically. I want you to call 877, the number 4, A-S-T-A-R-O, to schedule a free trial of an Astaro security gateway in your business. You can also visit Astaro.com, A-S-T-A-R-O. Dot com. If you're a, a non-commercial user, you can try it on VMware or put it on your own beige box. Astaro does offer this as a free download for non-commercial users. And the Astaro Up to Date, which used to be, they got an 80 euro uh, a year subscription, is free as well for non-commercial users. So it's a really great way to try Astaro. But if you're in a business, simpler, just call them. They'll put an appliance right in there. 877, the number 4. A-S-T-A-R-O. Take a look at the Astaro Command Center, which uh, lets the network administrator manage and control multiple gateways from a single dashboard, a world map, so you can see gateways all over the world if you're a, a big enterprise. They've got this uh, very sophisticated clustering uh, system that allows you to add Astaro gateways as you add desks, seats, ASTARO.com and uh, give them or give them a ring. 877, the number four, Astaro. We thank them for their support of Windows Weekly. So, we did talk a little bit last week about Jay Allard leaving uh, and Robbie Bach leaving yep. uh, the consumer what division. What was the consensus on that one? Coincidence? No. I mean, you know, Microsoft goes through reorgs regularly. This is part of a larger reorg. Um, yeah. I think the consensus was that the consumer division had reached maturity. And that <laughs> Wait, some might well. say senescence had reached maturity and that the particular talents of Jay Allard and Robbie Bach were no longer needed. And I was under I, the I'm impression that Jay Allard was the whiz kid. So I'm really surprised. To, well, I'd like to hear what you think. Yeah, no, a lot of people think that uh, that's a carefully cultivated image. But like I as I just pointed out. This guy's never made a successful product, not even once. Xbox 360, not, not or Xbox, not successful. No, because the Xbox 360 is really just an attempt to, uh, you know, get into the market and be one of the major players. And like I said, um, they're never going to make the money back that they spent developing it. And they might actually still come in third place in this generation of consoles. How amazing would that be? Right? They had a year-long head start. They've been destroyed by the Nintendo Wii. I, I would I just point out, by the way, uh, it is almost four years now since the Nintendo Wii came out. They are just now releasing something for the Xbox 360 this year that will respond to that console's number one selling feature, this that's motion all. capture stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's how, to that's be how fair, quick Sony this is, company is. Sony is now just responding, too. So sure. both oh, no, companies were, were taken off I'm just, guard. I'm talking Microsoft. I don't Sony does, <laughs> Screw Sony that. Screw those other things. Um, I, I think that uh, Microsoft expected to win this generation, not just to compete, but to win. This is an absolute defeat. Uh, from, from a user's perspective, uh, from a gamer's perspective, I love the 360. 
I've loved all eight of them that have come through my house because they are so unreliable that they break all the time. And by the way, I have two of them in my house right now. My son's is broken. Uh, my son's is less than 18 months old. It's no, probably I'm a year you. old. I'm with you on that. I have I, my I, second. I am, the red ring is no dead four times. I have no mercy for this yeah, at all. Right. Sorry. So they never really did fix excuses. that. Did they? No, yeah. they never really did. You can make all the excuses you want, but, you know, I, I don't... I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's not like I have the answer. I can't, I, I don't mean to say I could go back and make this work. I, I'm saying that the guys in charge of this stuff never made it work. And, uh, you know, this is too little too late. You know, that, that these guys leave the company, whether of their own volition or not. I mean, who can say? I have my suspicions. But uh, the very week that Apple surpasses Microsoft's market cap, and by the way, does so by competing in the types of products, by making the types of products that that division of the company was supposed to be doing. Um, I, think it, I think it's not a coincidence. That's how I look at that. I mean, it's hard to imagine that not, you know, that being a coincidence. Microsoft, of course, is responding in the wrong way. You know, uh, Steve Ballmer apparently is now sort of in charge of this himself. Are well, you no, kidding me? No, no. That I, mean, I had I, to laugh at. I mean... You gotta be... I mean, seriously. But that's, tempor that's temporary, right? Somebody will come I hope, along. I hope so. But they don't have time to waste. You know, it reminds me of the conversation I had with the Windows Mobile folks, which I know I relayed here on the podcast uh, recently. A couple of years ago, I said, you know, the iPhone's eating your lunch. What are you going to do about it? And this woman said, you know, the success of the iPhone uh, verifies the belief we've had all along. <laughs> Consumers would embrace smartphones. And I was like, God, what the... What? We're what Microsoft. We don't they, they have are, to care. They, they are embracing cell phones. You were right. They're embracing someone else's phones. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's just, it, it's depressing, you know. Yeah. Um, Microsoft's problem has really remained fairly consistent. And, and that is just like what I said earlier, that the business model that drove them to huge success in the PC market is not applicable to any of these other markets they want to compete in. It just doesn't work. And uh, I, I think I pointed uh, to this missed opportunity, but years and years ago, when Microsoft was offering up their first, um, you know, cable set-top box software, uh, the PC, I'm sorry, the cable industry was so scared of Microsoft because it was right around the time of the antitrust stuff. Uh, and Bill Gates was so belligerent that they collectively decided we're not doing business with these folks. And it's, it's hard to imagine how different the world could have been if Microsoft had gotten an in on the cable market, because if you've ever seen this software, it is actually fantastic. It's really nice. Um, but, you know, because of the belligerence of the company and of uh, Bill Gates particularly, uh, that never happened, you know. So, you know, the, t the living room today is still all screwed up. You know, the Apple TV's never really gone at anywhere, though it's excellent. Uh, Google is working on this Google TV thing. Microsoft has tried again and again with various things, including such, you know, wonder products as Windows Media Center, which requires putting a complicated, you know, rebootable PC in your living room so you can reboot your TV set like anyone wants to do that, or the loud and unreliable Xbox 360, or, you know, I mean, they've had all these things they've tried, and none of them have ever worked. And this is not the time <laughs> to be floundering with no strategy. And I, I'm, I'm concerned that they don't have a cohesive strategy. You know, as far as uh, competing with the tablet stuff goes, you know, they, they, there are Windows 7 tablets coming, but okay, that's a tablet PC. We've had that forever, right? It's just the next version of the ultra mobile PC or the tablet PC. Uh, there are these tablets coming that are going to be based on Windows embedded. There are two versions of that. One of them runs on ARM, which means, you know, iPad or Android style tablets, maybe smaller tablets. Can you tell me, can you clarify, because I've been reading a lot now because of, of all of these tablets about Windows embedded. It, what, how does that, what does it look like? How is it different? Yeah, so uh, there are two versions of it. One is a componentized version of Windows 7 that runs on x86 hardware only. It is uh, binary compatible with Windows 7 as OEMs or PC makers or, I guess, device makers can take this thing, break it down to the component parts that they want. They could literally leave stuff out if they wanted to. The idea being that they get a smaller, lighter, better performing system. But it looks and works like Windows 7. And then there's a version that's based on Windows CE, uh, the compact, embedded compact. Um, also componentized, not binary compatible with Windows, not necessarily x86. It's something that would typically run, run on ARM. The difference between the two, aside from some functional differences, are that the ARM version of Windows Embedded should offer better battery life. You know, one of the complaints 
uh, reportedly about Windows 7 on these small tablets is that the battery life isn't as good as, say, the iPad, right? About half. You know, with the HP Slate, as interesting as it kind of was, uh, apparently only got about five hours of battery life, you know? In, in this day and age, when netbooks can get eight to 12 hours of battery life, when the iPad gets 10 hours of battery life, and by the way, 10 hours of battery life watching movies, I mean, that's insane. Uh, five hours of battery life isn't going to cut it, you know? Yeah. So these people have their work cut out for them. Um, some of the products I just described, the, the embedded stuff, aren't even shipping until the end of the year. So, you know, the iPad comes out, sells millions of units, and there's no response, right? There's nothing, there's nothing to, to compete, <laughs> you know, with the iPad with, unless you Google, apparently, because now these Android tablets are coming out. By the way, as soon as this weekend, if I'm not mistaken, isn't the Dell... Uh, street coming out this weekend in the UK, I think this weekend. Yeah, and there's some like weird Taiwanese ones out already, but uh, and of course, at well, Computex, I think there's it, Steve Gibson said that he said counted 42 or something yeah. like that. New well, sure, but I mean, this is like at CES, um, yeah, we saw were, a ton uh, of dozen, ebooks, there were right. a dozen ebook readers. Right. I mean, I, I if you can find one human being on the earth using one of these off besides the Kindle, yeah. off brand Korean uh, <laughs> ebook readers, I mean, please, <laughs> I'd love to hear from them, but I mean, yeah. you know, no, I don't yeah, think right. that. So, yeah, people can announce whatever they want to announce. But, you know, the, the, the trick is to ship, you know. Um, say what you will about Apple, but, you know, they announce they're going to do it, and then they just kind of do it. And, by the way, people buy them, you know. Right. And I think that's the problem from the Microsoft perspective because there's no real response. And you can get uh, idgety about it and be like, oh, we've had this, you know, you know, we've had this for a long time, and why, why didn't people buy our stuff? You know, well, yeah, maybe you should have asked those questions, you know, when you had it, you know, because no one was interested. So, I mean, I, I, it's a problem. You know, it, it's definitely a problem. Um, just trying to what see. did the, I mean? I'm just curious. Did uh, Mary Jo Foley or uh, Ed have anything to say about R those guys leaving? Or yeah, well, I mean, like what I said, was the, they said this is just kind of a. A maturing of the consumer division. You know, they did not underscore in quite such stark detail as you did that what a failure their career was. And we, t <laughs> oh we no, I, I, by the way, I'm sure they would not describe it that way either. But uh, I no, challenge but you're you, right. What to, was or the, anyone to prove otherwise? I mean, I, you know, none of them made money. How do you measure success? I right. mean, I, I get that. You know, the Xbox. Do you think 360 they were fired because of lack of success? The way that Microsoft talks about these people. The way that Jay Allard is apparently still a um, he's going to do stay there an as advisor a of some kind of yeah. Steve Ballmer suggests to me. I hate to say this because you know I really like Steve Ballmer, but I think there is something going on where <laughs> I he clearly likes these guys. I think right. he really legitimately likes these guys, and I think maybe that's the problem. Right. You know, in some ways, it comes from the top. But the you, fact that but this the is board, the guy now, so. The board so, would yeah, be did, looking at bottom line, and the board would be saying these guys aren't doing, aren't performing. I would think. I mean, that's the job of a I, board. If I were a Microsoft stockholder, I would want to know why they lasted that long. And yet, technically, and by the way, when that Xbox 360 recall happened, I mean, are you telling me that it's Sony? Some guy wouldn't have, not literally, but figuratively dropped on a sword right then. Yeah. Oh, and seriously, Should right? Have. I mean, this Should would have, have happened. Yeah, that would have been the end of that guy's career at that yeah. company, right? I mean, how do you survive something like that? Well, what if, okay, so, I'm going to play devil's advocate. Because you could say technically that the Xbox 360 and the Zune are, are really um, successful. And it's merely the market that hasn't responded. I can't even say it with a straight face. <laughs> right. Okay. So that's, that's cute. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, really, the Zune is a good product. If the iPod but, hadn't but, been out, I, it would have been... Well. Listen, listen, listen. It, it is awkward to be put in this position... Uh, because this was like the Mac position for a long time. Like, we don't sell a lot, but, you know, we think, we feel like we had the better product, you know. Right. Neat. Uh, I, I agree with you, and I use a Zune, and I love it. It is uh, the superior device. It has the better UI. Right. It's, it, it's beautiful. The so it's a technical awesome. success. Okay. Sure. And the, the work that occurred there, which... Uh, dates back to some of the Media Center stuff and is going forward to Windows Phone. Right. I hope we'll have far-reaching implications, but the Zune should be a cautionary tale for anyone who's thinking that the Windows phone is just going to roar out of the gates and take over the world. I mean, it's obviously not enough to have the superior solution, um, as I think a Mac user would appreciate. I mean, I, I, that doesn't guarantee success. That's why when people ask me, 
and they do a lot via email. You know, you, I, I've gone and played with this Windows Phone thing. I'm absolutely blown away by it. So do you, you think it's going to be okay? You think they're going to compete? I have no opinion about that. I have no idea. Who can say? I, I can tell you that when you put your data on this phone and it lights up with all your stuff, it's, I hate to say this, it's like magical almost. I mean, it's amazing. Does that translate into sales? I, I, who, who can say? I mean, the, the, you know, who knows? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I have no idea. It is beautiful, but that does, you know, that's, that's not, not always, enough. That's not yeah. enough to not say always, you're a business. Enough. Yeah. Uh, but you don't believe the Rob Enderley's uh, thesis. No, no, that maybe I think that's, I, it's one of the funniest things I've ever read in my life. He I wasn't mean, serious. I would give anything for that to be true. <laughs> he's, he's, he, he said, yeah, you're right. Tongue firmly planted in cheek that yeah, yeah. perhaps Robbie Bach was a fifth columnist for Apple sent in as the fifth columnists were in World War II to undermine Microsoft's consumer. By the product. way, it's the only thing that would excuse the decade of behavior that I just described. Right. I mean, you know, um, I, I'm going to tell you a story and I, I can't tell you who said this to me. In fact, I want to be very careful about this, but uh, it, it kind of shows you the, the men, how the mentality can get in the way of things over at Microsoft. This was years ago. Um, Microsoft was revving their Windows Media software at the time. It was long, long before the Zoom. The iPod was coming on strong. iTunes had come out on Windows, I think. It was just about to or something like that. But it was, it was already becoming a phenomenon. It was already rolling over Windows Mobile, uh, Windows Media. And I said, I, may, I was at a Microsoft event at the campus, and I went out to get coffee or whatever, and find myself confronted by a Microsoft executive out in this hallway by myself. And he said, what do you think? And, of course, I, I can sense that this is a trap, you know. And I said, uh, what do you mean, you know? He said, well, what do you think about the stuff we're doing? And I said, well, um, it's good. You know, it is good. Um, solid update, you know, yada, yada, yada. But I don't see how this is going to change your position in the market with relation to Apple. And then he looked at me and with no sense of irony or comedy at all, he said, you mean our position of dominance, right? <laughs> and I was like, yikes. <laughs> because they were already getting their asses handed to them. I mean, by this point, I mean, you've got to be kidding me. But I, I mean, I'm not, I don't want these people to fail. I mean, there are good, smart people there and everything. But, I mean, I, I just, it's like they don't understand what's happening. They're just too big. And I think this is what Mary Jo yeah, and Ed I, think, too. They're just too big. You can't overstate the, the size of this company and the levels of bureaucracy and the infighting and the politics and the features that don't occur because of politics um, it, you know, because of people who aren't going to get credit for something or whatever it is uh, that occurs in a company that, that is that big. You know, Apple is a huge company, but one of the things I read that Steve Jobs said this week that I actually very much agree with is they're a big company, but they run like a startup. And Microsoft runs like the government of the United States, you know, that you can never get anything done because you always get mired in something down at some low level and nothing ever happens. Right. And the reason... There can't be a response that makes any sense out of this company is that they just, you know, they're too slow. And if they had been, and again, this is not a popular view, but I think that if they had gotten broken up by the government uh, a decade ago, that would have fixed a lot of these issues. Now, obviously it would have caused some issues as well. But Well, maybe, okay, you, let's, let's uh, take some of the, um, uh, the heat off of that and just say they should have broken, Dvorak's always said this, broken themselves up. Whether, not maybe yes, not the government, right. but so Microsoft another, should right. have re, should have said we're gonna we're gonna should make three companies. Themselves. They should have yep. done themselves. Oh, Operating there, systems, excellent. apps, there, consumer. Yeah, and there's a fun, there's a financial case to be made when you create three companies out of right. one. There's that more anyone who's a shareholder uh, suddenly, you know, has uh, three shares. Dvorak said this all along. I can't remember what yeah. divisions no, he I've was been thinking. saying. I've been saying the same thing. Yeah. And I, it, it, it's again, I think <laughs> politics and infighting and whatever. I mean, it's not a. It's a hard decision to make when you're the, the guy running. The only guy who could have done it, and it should have been, was Bill Gates as he's leaving his yeah. last official act. It's my company. I started it. Here's what I'm going to do. Probably we thought they were going to do this when they had the <laughs> office of the president, right? We thought yeah. this was coming. Yeah. Sure. And what would it be? Enterprise, operating system, consumer? What would it be? What would be the... Oh, there are different ways you could split it up. I mean, uh, there was talk, yeah, business consumer would be one uh, where you would actually have like an office group in each, you know, that would create products based off a common core 
uh, that would compete in certain markets. I mean, imagine if uh, Windows was sort of API compatible, but there were different versions for consumers and businesses hmm. you know, where the consumer version could be beautiful and whatever, and the business version would be That's very, you know. Yeah, that's a thought, you know, but uh, the, the problem with Microsoft and, you know, when you think about a company like Apple and they surpass Microsoft from a market cap perspective, a very, two very different kinds of companies. There is some overlap. They do compete in certain markets, but Microsoft is a vast company that compete in all these different markets. And uh, splitting out now would be, actually be very difficult because you'd almost have to split them into like 27 parts. I mean, there's a lot going on there, you know. Uh, they do have very successful businesses, obviously, around uh, PC operating systems and applications and servers. And I think they're going to have a very successful uh, business uh, out of online services that will kind of feed off of that stuff because it's a natural progression. Um, but once you get outside of that, you know, you don't see businesses that make a lot of money, whether it's entertainment and devices, whether it's uh, the online services stuff. Um, these other parts of the company... Are kind of treading water, right? I mean, and you know, for a long time, uh, when Windows was propping up everything, uh, that was okay. But I mean, my understanding is that uh, under this, uh, under Steve Ballmer in recent years, there's been a call to have these businesses justify their existence. And I think in some ways, Microsoft maybe needs to be a little more aggressive about that. And I, I think what they should be doing is just spinning it off, you know, spinning these businesses off. You know, maybe that's the answer. And this is, I think Mary Jo would agree with you. She says, uh, as uh, remember, we saw that uh, that New York Times uh, post uh, by the former Microsoft guy who said the, it's the infighting. It's the cross-divisional uh, yeah. jockeying for position that's killing a lot of this. And uh, Well, I think, here, I'll just give you a simple example, and I'm making this up. I, I want to be very clear. I don't know that this ever happened, but I'll, I'll, this will be an obvious one. Microsoft had, well, of course, now they're in the same division, so it's a little less obvious, but Microsoft, you know, Windows Live used to be in its own thing and Windows was its own thing. So you're developing Windows 7. And over on the side, they're developing Windows Live and they have the SkyDrive thing. So what does it take to get an icon in Explorer in Windows 7 that accesses your storage in SkyDrive on Windows Live? I mean, how hard could that be, right? It's Microsoft. I mean, this, why can't they do that? The problem is those are two different teams at the time working in two different divisions. Right? So there's a rivalry going on there. The Windows guys don't want code from these other guys in their system because they're working on this thing that's going to be stable and perfect and clean and beautiful. And the Windows Live guys aren't going to hand over their baby to Windows because right. they've been working on it for five years. This and they, you know, ours. This is ours, yeah. So now ex you know, extrapolate that out to the 150,000 different projects or whatever it is. And you can see it's amazing anything gets done over there. I mean, it's, cr it's crazy. You know, Windows Live uh, is on an 18-month schedule. Windows is on a three-year schedule. This is how the Titanic moves. It's a big, complicated superstructure. You know, it's not a, it's not a nimble, fast little uh, uh, startup. No, it's, just, it's, it's an it's oil a, tanker. It's it, it really is. Yeah, yeah. that can't it's turn on. Done. Spewing market share all over the place. You know? <laughs> they need to put a dome on that thing. <laughs> Operation Top Kill. Let's stuff some golf balls in that leak. Yeah, the, uh, their people have uh, an idea to, to nuke the oil, uh, to, to fuse the rock and, you know, prevent the oil from spilling out. What could go wrong? That would solve a problem what and could go may wrong? possibly cause some others. <laughs> I don't know. It's so depressing, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's really sad. Um, but enough of this. Let's get back to the real matter at hand. Modern okay. Warfare 2. I I, I, so, by the way, as of now, I checked uh, during the last ad. Um, the, the second map pack for Modern Warfare 2 on the Xbox 360 is now available. Actually, and I didn't put this in the show notes, but you know what else is available? What? The soundtrack for Modern Warfare 2 is available on iTunes and Zune. I'm buying it. And you should buy it. It's awesome. It's by Hans Zimmer. Yes! We love anyway, Hans I Zimmer. Haven't, uh, <laughs> I, I, I remember seeing that this second uh, map pack was coming out, and I'm thinking, oh, geez, I'm in trouble because... Yeah, because you're just, at 10th Prestige. You've completed just, the game. Well, I just talked about how I'm never going to play this thing again. Yeah. You know? But the, actually, the truth is I haven't played it. Um, I, I, I'm i going to download it, um, but I'm, I'm really busy on the book. And Yeah, yeah don't download it. Don't. Stop. No, I'm not. I, I don't. My son will want to play it, but I mean, I. I um, oh, Paul. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna oh, look at Paul, it. Paul, 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 Paul. Busy. Uh, you know. Sorry. Paul, I mean, I, Paul, Paul, I think now through the end of July, I got to get this book done. And July, we're going away uh, to Germany, so I won't be playing Call of Duty there. 
So, yeah, it's going to be a while. You're going away again in July? We do a home swap every uh, in August. We but are. you were just in Portugal. Yeah, but every August we do a home swap, so we're going to Germany. I'll be, you, you won't even know. <laughs> yeah, because they have bandwidth. The background, the background will be different, but I'll still be here. Yeah, you'll I'm be not. wearing later hosen, but other than that, there will <laughs> yeah. be no difference. Right, we'll be eating a lot of pork and uh, Wiener Schnitzel. You know, and stuff, yeah. Kartoffel mit Schlag. Anyway, uh, I've been checking all day. You know, my son went off to school and he's like, you're going to get it, right? You're going to, you know. Oh, it's and so uh, it, it, it hasn't been available, but literally it just became available. How do they feel about my, I didn't really think about this, but What's uh, Call of Duty, uh, do they like that in Germany or is it banned? Well, you know, the new versions, of course, are they're, modern. Warfare, they're not they're Nazis not. anywhere, so. Uh, I think there were some issues around the early Call of Duty games, and, but I think it was around Nazi insignias, which are not... Um, They're not allowed you know, in Germany. Kind of an issue in Germany, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, let's see here. Do you want to do the Windows Seven feature of the week? Would you like to get into that? Because I, I would be. I would I be happy. It's time. To. I think it's time. Okay. Okay. We'll save the Audible pick for uh, right before your software picks of the week. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so appropriately, the feature of the week this week is, of course, the tablet PC software <laughs> that is in Windows 7. Um, I am not using it regularly now. In fact, I need to get it back to Lenovo, but I had tested a Lenovo ThinkPad X200, which has multi-touch and all oh, the tablets. Oh, you know, stuff. people are raving over this. Ed Bot, which was talking about it last yeah. week, he loves this. It, it, it really is good. And, and that's why, you know, when the iPad was coming out, I was kind of scoffing, like, oh, yeah, we were doing this, you know. Um, you can do such things on this as, you know, run uh, the New York Times uh, reader application and touch, you know, do the touch thing to navigate. It works great. Yeah. Or use um, uh, the Amazon Kindle application and, you know, flick the pages just like you do on the iPad. I mean, this is available on Windows. So, uh, and it has been, you know, for some time. But, you know, Microsoft doesn't get any credit uh, here. But, uh, you know, <laughs> it, this would be an interesting about face if you think about it. You know, if... If the iPad becomes the mainstream computing device of the future, um, Microsoft will be able to pull an Apple and say, well, yeah, but, you know, we we were the ones that, you know, started this work back in, you know, whatever. And, that you know, they did do a lot of work evolving uh, these interfaces for the PC. So, you know, today in Windows 7, uh, there's touch and multi-touch that works throughout the entire system, part of Windows Touch. Um, improved pen support, right? So you can work with a stylus that does handwriting uh, input. You can also use the uh, the software based input using the tablet input panel. Um, you know, handwriting recognition that works with twenty six different languages. Is it is it good? Is it pretty good? It is good. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, but the the problem is, for it depends on what you need it for. I I I actually saw I, this. This made me laugh. I wish I I wish I had the exact quote here. There was a story today about the iPad, and, and some analyst said, you know. Uh, I think this thing's going to be really popular on the factory floor. It's going to be popular with salespeople. And I'm thinking to myself, this is exactly what they said right. about the tablet PC 10 years ago, yeah. right? Um, f for specific markets, yeah, absolutely. This thing makes a lot of sense. You know, for me, the truth is every once in a while, I'll be in some meeting room and I'm taking notes on my laptop and some guy writes up something on the uh, on the whiteboard and I think, wow, you know, wouldn't it be cool if I could flip this screen around and write on the screen and, and draw what he's drawing? And then I realize mm. I have a digital camera. I'll just take a picture of it. Right. You know, I mean, I, I happen to type very quickly and I happen, I happen to write very poorly. So for me personally, you know, all this ink support, you know, seriously, like a decade or two of R&D that went into this and all that stuff, it just doesn't benefit me personally. But obviously in, in certain markets, uh, I think that stuff is uh, would be beneficial. So... If you're looking for, a, I would say, the premier kind of premium, you know, PC experience, literally, uh, in one Windows 7, you know, computer, you could have the multi-touch screen with the pen support, stylus, it does media center, you could touch everything and uh, utilize the entire interface using just your finger if you wanted to. I mean, it's all available, and there are computers that do this, and, you know, the X200 is one example, but there are actually many of them. There are even netbooks that have this stuff. So I, th I think the big thing in Windows 7... Uh, is simply that it's now available across the board, essentially, unless you have a starter edition, and that the functionality now includes such things as touch and multi-touch. You know, it's it's the full meal deal. And I think that Microsoft's strategy, such as it is for competing with the iPad, is going to involve uh, the, uh, a tiered lineup of products. And at the, at the high end, the premium experience is going to be the full PC experience. 
running on a tablet with the ability to run any software, but also have the multi-touch and the and the ink support and stuff. I uh, no nothing. I just pushed the wrong button. Just trying to play some. Modern Warfare 2 sounds, and for some reason I got uh, David Mamet's lost masterpiece of pornography. Huh. Just the sitting there on your computer. The shop of yeah. a Beverly Hills dentist <laughs> constitute a treasure trove, not only of cinematic history, but a living document of the mores and morals of a time gone by. <laughs> okay, thank you. I don't know how that came up. <laughs> This is what happens when you how click is, around on dig.com. <laughs> how is that guy not on the Twit Network? <laughs> We're getting him. We're working on it. I've been I've been working hard. I just need to know his name. He'd be like a roving reporter guy. He would get into everything. He would. He'd be the guy. People would just look at him and say, you look familiar. You can come in. He'd be the guy. Right? <sighs> yeah, because he's so dignified. He's got something we lack here called dignity. <laughs> Gravitas. Dign Gravitas, baby. Yep. Our Windows 7 tip of the week. <laughs> so I did one last week, uh, but I wasn't here. But I'll just what mention do you mean? You just did it like you what, stood out in a plaza well, I, in I Portugal just, I, and just did one, <laughs> even just, though no one was listening. Is that I put, what happened? No, I put, I put, no, no. I, I, I don't talk to myself. I, I, I put it on the site. So there's a, a Windows 7 tip oh, of last you week. You never, you never. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, I'll just mention it briefly. You can go see it on the site. But it's about personalizing your desktop with wallpaper and arrow themes and so forth. And uh, Microsoft has a bunch of great themes you can get, including a brand new uh, Bing Bing's Best Three, the quickening <laughs> um, theme, uh, which is, the the Bing themes are great. And uh, I have my own themes. You know, I've made some themes from some of my trips. You know, are I've the been, Bing's like, a slideshow? Because I like to have multiple uh, desks. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're very high quality. And do they uh, update really, with new Bing pictures all the time? No, they don't. So they're coming out with you know different sets of them over time. But they're really, really beautiful. Uh, they should, by the way. That capability is actually built into Windows. So. Yeah, it would be nice if they did that. Yeah, I don't know why that's not in there. So this week's Windows 7 tip of the week is uh, about getting free internet TV with Windows Media Center. One of, one of you know, just like the tablet PC, one of those features you just kind of get in Windows that people don't even realize is there. And uh, Media Center started life as Microsoft's, uh, what they call the 10-foot interface for digital media content. And the idea was that you would put this screen up on your TV and you would interact with the computer using a remote control. Now, in recent versions of Windows, it's been restructured a little bit so that it works well with the keyboard and the mouse, and it also works with touch and multi-touch and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, most people don't connect their TV, I'm sorry, their computer to a, a TV source of any kind, like an antenna. So the, the, the sort of uh, underlying point of Media Center goes largely unused. And what they did in Windows 7 is they've added a number of uh, ways in which you can get TV-like content including stuff that integrates with the TV guide uh, in Media Center, uh, such as Internet TV, which provides a bunch of free TV shows. I mean, a lot of them are lousy old shows like MacGyver, and they have like the first uh, season of Star Trek is in there. And I actually was looking at this the other day, and, and I ended up watching an entire episode of Star Trek, uh, if you can believe that. The original? Go, yeah, the first season. They go back in time, and you know, this, the Enterprise gets up on the, uh, the radar of the United States government. And they, is this the one where they're in the gangster outfits? No, no, no. Oh, okay. no. It's, my, it's like modern day at the time. US. Oh, okay. Um, but it's cool, you know. And, and the other thing is if you're, if you're a Netflix subscriber, uh, that's also part of it as well. So you can access Netflix through Media Center. Oh, awesome. There's no monthly cost like there would be on the awesome. Xbox 360. And it's not view only, just like with the new uh, Netflix Roku software. You can manage your queue, view the queue, you know, move things around and all that kind of stuff. So um, lots of awesome TV-like content is available for free in Media Center. You just have to know to go look for it. It's not obvious at all. So it's it's something to check out. So from Windows 7, just uh, launch Windows Media Center. You know, you can search for it. And um, this stuff will appear, and you can go to town and enjoy it. Yay. I like these tips because it gives me uh, stuff to do and, and upgrade yeah. and so forth. It's always fun to have some new content. Love that. Now, speaking of new content, we're going to take a break, come back in just a bit with uh, Paul's software picks of the week. You got two tips. He's got two picks. He's very, it's the generous Paul. Yeah. Did you see Jean-Louis Gasset's uh, article, by the way, on his uh, Monday letter? No. Um, Monday Note, it's uh, mondaynote.com. Jean-Louis Gasset was the former Apple executive who went off to start BOS. He has no standing whatsoever to talk about how to run a company. Well, <laughs> however. Yeah. Does he criticize Microsoft? Yeah. He says, Steve Ballmer just opened the second envelope. Oh. 
Sure. Do you know what that? So, you know that envelope uh, uh, anecdote is? Is it the one that uh, Apple handed him when they didn't buy his company? No, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no. We, yeah, really. No, there's the the famous um, joke, which every executive knows. The uh, departing CEO meets his successor as he's walking out the door and hands him three envelopes and says, uh, "I'll put and put on the front when to open the envelopes when trouble strikes." The first crisis, the message in envelope one says, "Blame your predecessor." It was his fault. Easy sure. enough. Time on their tradition. Another yeah. crisis, another envelope. The CEO opens it. Reorganize. Yep. Okay, good idea. The third calamity, the third crisis strikes. The CEO opens the third envelope. It says, get three envelopes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, according to guests, nice. a bomber is the reorganization. He's opening the second envelope. He says, this is... this this." It Come this on, there have been lots of reorganizations. I, I think like this that. is not the first time, even under Steve. Um, right? I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to criticize this guy too much. I happen to be a big fan of his, and from you know, from a technical perspective, speaking of things that were excellent, uh, BOS it was, was awesome. Yes, um, and arguably at the time uh, was closer but, to being a consumer-friendly OS than Next was. You know, so but uh, same, just like Xbox 360 or Zune, it wasn't exactly a marketplace hit. Oh no! no. Oh no! Yeah. Despite the fact that on screensavers we did everything we could to make it a hit because we loved it. Oh, it was beautiful. It was, beautiful. I mean, it was so beautiful. I was doing BOS tips. <laughs> That's how much I liked I, it. Listen, I, I, I lost a decade myself just trying to find something that could replace the Amiga. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, you that get, was one of many yeah. possibilities, you know, of the mid-90s yeah. or mid yeah. to late-90s where, you know, oh, maybe this will be the one. And, yeah, no, not really. It's too bad. But he does maybe say something somewhat true, which is that mm -hmm. the bomber, uh, who is a great salesman, uh, I never he, thought he should have run the company. Maybe he's I mean, not a great strategist. Microsoft was run by a technologist for most of its yep. existence. I'm not saying it was run properly or whatever, but it was. And uh, he's not that kind of guy. You know, he couldn't be more different from Bill Gates if you tried. I mean, yep. they're polar opposites, really. Um, so, oh well. Yeah, here we are. Oh, well, here we are. Well, by the way, I mean, Microsoft, you know, I, you know, everything, if, I feel like everything we have to say about any of this stuff, there's always this other side, you know. I mean, Microsoft still makes money, like, like, you know, like with a printing press, right? I mean, this is a company that still generates unbelievable, unbelievable revenues every quarter. And by the way, did so when they were selling Vista um, and unbelievable profits, mm -hmm. profits that dwarf anything that Apple makes. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I think the problem is when you look forward, I mean, we love technology. We love good technology. Um, I've said this before. I don't want to root for an IBM. I'm not interested in that kind of company. I, I want good technology. And, uh, you know, Microsoft can and, and does make good products. Um, but I think we're clearly at a crossroads of sorts here. I mean, this is a company that could continue to generate money but not be interesting. You know, and that's the fear from my perspective. Just like um, IBM, for instance, which is... Going yeah, exactly. nowhere, but it's not an interesting company. Not even slightly. Yeah. At least for those of us who don't believe enterprise consulting is the wave of the future. <laughs> right, service. <laughs> I'm going to get into services. <laughs> the last refuge of the scoundrel. Uh, <laughs> time to talk about audible.com. Audible is, of course, our favorite place to go when we want audiobooks. 75,000 titles deep now. It is a great bookstore online. And yeah. one of the challenges of Audible really is there's so much great stuff. I mean, you just want to you want to read everything, um, and, and every category. I mean, there's business literature, there's classics, there's stuff, fiction and nonfiction, history. I love the bios. I read a lot of the sci-fi. Just there's a ton of great stuff. And there's some, you know, sometimes I think people should read something funny. And oh, you're yeah. going to recommend a funny book? Yeah, kind of a funny book. I mean, I've done some of the comedian books recently, but. Um, yeah, this one is a short history of nearly everything. It's I kind think of a Bill is, he's just got a great wry sense of humor. He's very much like you, actually. <laughs> okay. Well, this is uh, the problem with this pick then, because there are two versions of this book. Yeah. There's the, the unabridged version, which I generally recommend. Yeah. Um, in this case, read by someone else who's very good, British, you know, actually very good. And then there's the abridged version that's read by the author. Who probably does a better job. It's pretty close. I, I've, I've tried them both. I, I did, in fact, get the unabridged version, if that uh, helps tilt anyone's uh, You wouldn't think decision. you'd need to abridge a book called A Short History 
of nearly yeah, everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's an even shorter history of nearly anything. <laughs> it I, is I 17 hours long. I mean, it's a long book, yeah, really. Yeah. Well, not as long as the history of nearly everything, though. <laughs> and I think that's the point. As long as you come in a few minutes under, you, you know, shorter. you've established <laughs> your goal. But I think the thing I like about this, um, which doesn't sound like a good idea in the beginning, is that this is, you know, described by the author as, I'm not a scientist, so please allow me to explain to you how science works. Yes, I love you it. Know, but he, and he talks to, you know, people who know what they're talking about and, and describes, as he understands it, the, the history of the, of the, you know, the universe. This I guess, would be world. a good first book on Audible because you really yeah. would get sucked into this and enjoy it, I think. Yep, yeah. yep. That's we listened to audiobooks uh, back and forth to Europe on this last trip, my wife and I, and um, I'm still not caught up. I mean, I, not that I wanted the plane to turn around and go back just so I could finish, but uh, yeah, well, I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't get to commute, you know, so... Um, this was a chance to get right. caught up on. Well, it's funny because I, uh, the, uh, the new Audible um, app for Android is now in beta. And, oh, um, oh it's, yeah. it's really great. I, I really like it because um, you could browse your whole library. Uh, oh, nice. It. So, nice. so you, you know, when you first install it, it downloads your library and it keeps that up to date. And then you pick the books that are in the uh, library. So it's like the Kindle app um, on yeah. the iPhone will be on the... You uh, can see Amazon's the... influence. Plus it keeps, and you'll like this... Oh, I have my SD card is mounted. Let me put it on this one. Uh, you'll like it because um, it uh, does stats, <laughs> which is really oh, no. fun. It tells you how many hours you've listened, and you know it, it's really it's it, they've done such a nice job. It's in beta. You have to go to a Google, join a Google Groups to get it. It's not on the mm -hmm. marketplace yet. Groups.google.com and look for the Android Audio uh, beta. But boy, they've done a nice job of this. Why was I bringing it up? I can't remember. There was some reason. Well, anyway, I love the way the Amazon, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Kindle app works for that very reason because, you know, again, you could just be out and about and you're like, well, I haven't downloaded this thing yet, but well, it gives you the whole library. That's, that's what mm -hmm. I was thinking is, no, you can't buy books on here. You still have to buy them online, but it's your library. And yeah, but you have to think that's coming, right? Yeah, and, why uh, not? But what had happened is I was going back through stuff and there's tons of stuff in here that I downloaded but never listened to. Right. That's what I was, so that now, was my now point. You're out, you could be on a trip or whatever in the car exactly. or whatever it is. Exactly. And, yeah, great. And now I can finally get going on And this you thing. can sort it by title, author, and also by length. You can actually Oops. look for what is the longest book I have here. Right. <laughs> uh, and one of them was the biography of Einstein that I downloaded uh, probably a year ago and meant to listen to and never got around to. And so now I'm going to listen to it. The longest book, by the way, that I have on my Audible is David McCullough's uh, no, biography of Truman. Truman, yeah. Which is 53 hours. And by the way, have I listened to it? No. So if I'm ever... I'm, that's, if ever, whoever did the narration of that didn't get paid enough. I think it was David McCullough. He, a lot of really? times he does his own... Well, he's such a good reader. I hope it's him. It's eight parts. It's so big. <laughs> it's... No, it's not. I think it's so. a guy named Nelson... Oh, Nelson Runger did the... Uh, he's actually one of their better readers. Audible.com. Go there right now. In fact, if you go to audible.com slash windows, you'll get your first book free. If you are an Android user, uh, this works beautifully. It is beta. I, there may be some issues with it. I haven't found any. Uh, but I've, I've really, it, what's nice, and it has a widget, by the way, you can put on the desktop. So uh, now I can, I can listen. I know what book I'm listening to. I just press play right on the desktop. I can listen. I can add a bookmark when I hear something I want to go back to right mm -hmm. from the, uh, right from the phone. This is, you know, it, of course, it plays on every device and it works fine on the iPhone, but they don't have an, a dedicated app. And I think the dedicated right, app is really right. slick. So I was for a long time saying works on everything except Android. Now I can say works on everything. Audible.com slash Windows. Get your first book free. And Paul's recommendation, a great, I highly agree. Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything. Audible free for you if you go to audible.com slash Windows. All right, Paul, time for... Some software picks from you. Okay, I have two. Um, the second of the two is for the more hardcore guys in the audience. But um, the first one is Google Picasa 3.6. It's the latest version of Google's free photo editing tool. Um, I use this primarily because I use Google's Picasa web on the back end to back up my photos. And this is a tremendous front end for that. But, you know, it's free software. And even if you're a fan of Windows Live Photo Gallery, which is also excellent, um, it's, there's no reason not to have both of these things on your PC because they both do certain things better than the other. And, uh, just from a, an editing perspective, I have yet to see many digital photos, you know, taken off of a digital camera that wouldn't benefit from some fine tuning. And I'd say both these tools are fantastic for this, but 
uh, Windows Live Photo Gallery has a, a plugin architecture that allows you to use the application with different online services. But uh, in the latest version, I well, it doesn't actually doesn't matter which version you have, but I found that Google's software surprisingly uh, <laughs> works better with Google's backend. So if you are using Google Picasa Web, um, this is a must-have. But it's a great application. It's a it's just a really, really good application. I like it so much. I bought like 50 gigs of store. No, more than that. 100 gigs of storage because I just. Yeah, I think I have more than that. Yeah, I, it's really nice. You have to pay extra for more storage, but uh, it's a really nice no, but it's, way. It's worth it. And they oh, keep yeah. bumping it up and lowering the cost, you know. So I, I actually forget where, um, where I started. But where I'm at now with Google is I buy, let me see. I buy 200 gigs of storage. And, and but I'm only using 17% of it, about 33.82. But that's literally 33.82 gigabytes of photos. That's what that is. Yeah. And about, uh, you know, uh, four well, it's, gigabytes. It's all in your docs. It's everything. So it's email. It's docs. It's yeah. all. It's oh, but, one. But the 33.82 is just photos. Oh uh, wow! In my case. You are yeah, uploading so everything. <laughs> wow. Well, why why not? I yeah. mean, <laughs> you know, why not? And you know, uh, I hate to give you a plug for Android, but. Uh, then on your Android phone, all of those photos are available uh, through the gallery app. Damn you and your Google integration. <laughs> the integration on Google, for what it's worth. Oh, yeah. Eh, of course. That's what they do, right? That's what they do. That's fine. We don't, don't begrudge them that. No, we don't. No, I mean, if, if Microsoft had uh, some kind of online storage that I could buy that much, I'd do it. But they don't. SkyDrive. Yeah. It's cute. But, yeah. SkyDrive. I'd love to use it. I can't wait another 18 months for the next SkyDrive. I, I need to I back up my photos now. So Yeah. yeah. So uh, Google's good. Picasa, it is absolutely, and it's also free, so why not have have it, you know? Right, right. Cost you nothing. Yep. Can, is there a way to, do you duplicate your photos, or can you uh, add by reference to the library so you don't have to have an extra copy? There, there's no uh, automated way to get them up there. So I actually, um, I, the reason I had this pick was right before my trip, I wanted to make sure that everything was off of my... right server here not off of but also backed, backed up. up so yeah um i i spent some time doing it. it's 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 interesting once you get going on it though because it loads up the um you know your photo library you just right click on each one upload to picasso web the only change i have to make is to make sure that it's the full size photos so every time the dialog comes off i change it from whatever the recommendation is to the full size and i click okay and it just you know it just goes you can um you know queue up 15 or 20 of them at a time and then just let it go and it, it actually moves pretty quickly. So then I got back and I uh, backed up the pictures from our trip. I was, you know, and I try to stay on top of it as time goes. But yeah, I mean, I'm still waiting for that killer, you know, home server automated backup something, you know. But we'll get there eventually. I just want to make sure my pictures are somewhere else. You know. <laughs> Anywhere else? Well, other than my house, you know. Right. No, no, no. Else. That's that's a good form of backup. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, tip two, which is also free. Yeah, this one I found out about from Ed Bot actually. So thank you to him for blogging about this. But it's called RAM Map, and it is from the geniuses uh, Mark Rosinovich and Bryce Cogswell from Sysinternals. And it's oh. uh, it's actually a brand new tool that they released. And it's a uh, you know, I think we can all agree that the um, you know the task manager in Windows has certainly improved over the years, but it's lacking in some ways. And what this application will do is give you a map of what's going on in memory and let you figure out what's using what and so forth. And uh, it does so in a pretty graphical way. And it's a, uh, it's just a, I, you know, again, I, it's not a tool for everyone, but if you, if, I don't know if you have that, yeah, you have the page up. So it's got a, um, it's just got a nice display. And if you want to see what's going on with the resources on your system, uh, the RAM resources, um, it's a great tool for doing that. So it's, it's sort of a, a task manager style thing, but just not, much more graphical and, and nicer we no longer need to manage ram in any way though i windows 7 and even no but you know no no of course not but yeah. sometimes something goes wrong or your system is not behaving the way you want it to and it's not clear what's going on i mean i, I think it's eye-opening to anyone you know if you open up task manager this application to see the number of processes that are yes. running you know if you run chrome for example chrome has a different process for every tab but i only i mean i'm running chrome with four tabs right now i've got I don't know, 10 Chrome processes. I mean, something's not closing there. But then there's this other stuff going on that you may not understand. You know, it, it's it's something to look into. Uh, there's something called Adobe Flash Player Helper running on my system right now. I'm not very excited about that. No. You know, there's there's an internet low mic utility tool, right? right? 
Right. The mesh operating system is running, despite the fact that I've uninstalled Windows Live Mesh. Um, you know, so it's that's it's healthy occasionally to look and and see what's and going see on. Well, that suggests that Live Sync is in fact using Mesh. Oh, okay. Yeah, anyway, I agree. I, I, Mark is brilliant, and all of his tools yep. are, are wonderful. Yep. All the systems yeah, are internal. It was a good acquisition on Microsoft's part. I think. Yeah, and it's nice that they're still working on this kind of stuff because yes. this is the type of thing that they did uh, for years. It was very valuable, you know, to the Windows community. So. Nice. I want to remind our listeners, uh, if you are interested in Windows, that uh, we are we do a show called This Week in Computer Hardware with Ryan Shroud of PC Perspective uh, and my old buddy Patrick Norton of Tixilla and formerly of the Screensavers. And I'll be joining them this evening. Uh, we broadcast that live at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, it's kind of late. I think it's uh, 1 a.m., 1 in the morning, 13, oh, 100, rather, uh, UTC. But uh, you can also listen to it on a podcast. And we'll be talking about some of these uh, Computex announcements, I'm sure. You know, um, you just reminded me. Next week, I'm going to TechEd in New Orleans. Aren't but you I think lucky? I'm flying. Yes, I guess. Um, <laughs> I think I'm fl actually flying home on Thursday, so I don't know if we can. Um, we'll, move your, we'll move you around. Move How it about Wednesday that? Or Best thing to do, yeah, we'll move, we'll flip flop with uh, Steve or something. The best thing to do if you normally we do this show uh, on Thursdays at two p.m. Eastern, mm -hmm. eleven a.m. Pacific, eighteen hundred UTC at live.twit.tv. And again, I just tell you when you can watch live. You can always download it after the fact. Both audio and video are available uh, on iTunes, the Zoom Marketplace, everywhere podcasts are, or just twit.tv slash ww. And if you go to live.twit.tv, we post the Twit Live recording schedule on there. And when there are changes, like next week. Uh, that'll be reflected in the calendar as soon as we know. So if you want to know when to watch Paul next week, we'll probably we'll flip flop you, Paul. If you want to do it Wednesday, yeah, that's fine. If that's okay, okay with you guys. Yeah. Well, it's just it's Steve. We have to see if Steve can do it. But mm -hmm. usually, Mr. Gibson, since he's uh, not really employed, <laughs> doesn't mind. He's, it's sad what's happened to him. <laughs> he's very flexible. <laughs> he's very yeah. flexible. So uh, we'll see if we can flip flop with Steve. Maybe do this next Wednesday. Okay. I I will send you a note. Thank you, sir. Make sure you go to Paul's site, the super site for Windows at winsupersite.com. All of the things we talk about on this show are reflected and, and, and obsessed upon in great detail uh, <laughs> at the Win yes. Super site, site. I mean, that's really, that's really where Paul gets to um, express his neuroses. Yes. Yes. It's a multimedia extravaganza. extravaganza including the blog and everything else. It's actually you know, a must read. It's my, one of my favorite blogs. And it didn't wasn't intentional, but it, it ends up being that a lot of the people we have on these shows are bloggers. Yeah. And uh, and it makes sense because you guys create a lot of content. And well, look, we're all sitting in a room by ourselves talking to ourselves anyway. You're very I mean, lonely, you might as well just lonely stick a microphone people. in there and yeah. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> it's very easy. <laughs> it's the same very thing. Easy to do. Yeah. Winsupersite.com. Paul's working on the new book, which is uh, I can't wait for. That will be uh, out sometime uh, this fall when Windows 7 comes out. The, uh, Windows I Phone 7. Windows wait Phone for it to be done myself. I bet you can't. Your trip to my to Redmond was fruitful? Yes, it was. So you now know everything there is to know. Well, I, <laughs> about Windows I guess, Phone. I mean, I, yeah. Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, close enough. All right. And, uh, uh, of course, Paul will be back next week at some time to do Windows Weekly. We'll release it. We release it on Friday. So anytime before Friday, Paul's good with me. Okay. We'll see you then on Windows Weekly.